We're funded through literally thousands of projects that come down from DOE and other government agencies where they say, we need you to go do this, we need you to go do that. And there's no line in the federal budget that says Oak Ridge National Lab, 1.65 billion, go do good things. The idea of this loop to retain our expertise in using high temperature salts, we're using an inductive power supply around the test section. And without using fission, it's kind of the only way to really get heat into the system Consortium for Advanced Simulation of the Light Water Reactors, CASEL. We're focusing on pressurized water reactors, new fuels that are more tolerant and resistant to uh, accident scenarios like loss of coolant and cladding integrity. If I'm going to have to get up every day for 50 or 60 years and working on something, well, it ought to be something I believe in. Or whether this be a solar power tower or a molten salt reactor, liquid salts are an outstanding heat transfer media. It really doesn't matter what you're going to be transferring heat for. And there are a number of technologies that have never been done before in salt. When they were developing the molten salt reactor, they had test loops from material testing to pumps. Silk and carbide, we're going to find out how that performs in a salt environment. Wigner was a chemical engineer. Uh, the lab was very strong in chemistry. These would not have been possible if we hadn't have had the Shockley breakthroughs. Chadwick discovered a neutron in 1932, over one generation. Think about how far we came. The beam is coming, the crystals focus it, scatter it down onto the sample. We're really interested in thermoelectrics, heat harvesting, superconductors, magnetic materials, ferroelectric materials. Last summer, we irradiated lutetium. 26 patients were treated for brain cancer. And people have talked about how terrible highly enriched uranium is. Here's highly enriched uranium being put to very productive uses. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it. Your pebble bed is a little bit of a transition in that the pebbles can kind of percolate up through, so you get some movement of the fuel. Yeah, I find it ironic that the birthplace of many of our country's nuclear technologies is still run on coal. You're here in the radiological buffer area. This is an old facility. Look down before you walk. No, don't, don't touch it. Your hands are going to look like this. Okay. I have a small child. It is oh. like a lead pencil, isn't it? Why aren't we building lots of new nuclear reactors? It would be nice to see ORNL regaining that role of, um, you know, really, let's work out what's the best way to do this. And we were always nuclear. We just didn't talk about it much. But the discussion has been is what's waste and what's not waste. At some point, we're going to want to reprocess, likely. And, and we ought to hold that option open. We'd bring the carrier over, line it up with the scale. We're dealing with uranium in less than a half a gram measurements. In 1968, they took out the U-235 and added U-233. Uh, we shipped it over to storage, and they have the world's collection of U-233. These things right over here are the spent probes. So you got a pipe within a pipe, so those things would extend to like 60 foot in length. It is shifting people's thinking to think a little bit more long term, and right now there's a lot of focus on assuring the LWR industry gets the life extension. Currently in this country we're not really looking at the molten salt uh, fueled systems. In 2012, Thorium Advocates traveled from Huntsville, Alabama towards Chicago, Illinois to attend the fourth Thorium Energy Alliance Conference. Scheduled along the way was a full day tour of Oak Ridge National Lab's nuclear facilities. The entire eight-hour tour was captured on video for an upcoming documentary about thorium's potential as an energy resource. Recording devices included a Zoom H4N, Canon Vixia HFs, Apetech HDs, Seinhauser 100s, and a dozen 4GB SanDisk clip loaded with open source Rockbox firmware. And one iPhone. You know, the Navy had reactors, <laughs> and so the Air Force had to have reactors. <laughs> In order to drive a turbine, you need high temperatures, so you had to have a high temperature reactor. And that led to this thing called the aircraft reactor experiment that was uh, operated in the 50s. The dirty little secret was that most of the people involved in it knew from the get-go that it really wasn't practical. Um, <laughs> But they also felt like this was a good way to solve a lot of the problems associated with high temperature reactors because the, the Navy program uh, that led to the light water reactors we have now was well optimized to the needs of the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually wasn't very well optimized to the needs of power production. The reason we have that as the base for our power reactor technology today is because the Navy was prepared to pay the first mover costs to make one work. And once you've done that, it's extraordinarily difficult to compete with it because those first mover costs are very, very high and have no financial return associated with them. Um, so 
the aircraft reactor experiment was essentially an effort to duplicate that model for high temperature reactors. Uh, and the, the Achilles heel was that um, in contrast to a submarine where you know, you've, you've got limited space but you can shield it uh, for the people on the submarine, it's much harder on an airplane because of the weight. So where we are today, uh, we're, the, we're the largest science and energy lab within the DOE system. And there are some labs that are focused on a particular type of energy technology. So you have the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. They do renewables. You have Idaho National Lab that's the sort of uh, designated lead lab for nuclear energy. Princeton does fusion. We actually are active in all those areas. Because we're a, fundamentally a science lab, there's sort of a base of scientific understanding in things like materials and biology and so on that's very useful for energy technology and sort of feeds into it. Uh, and that science base, you don't know how it's going to impact and where it's going to impact. So having that portfolio is useful because it's a little bit hard to know where things are going to go. Uh, the other reason I think it's important is as we look at the energy problem, things you need to do to mitigate CO2 emissions, it's actually pretty much rigorously true that there's no single point solution. You've got to make progress in all areas fairly significantly mm -hmm. in order to be able to do it. So that's, that's why we're kind of pushing on all fronts. And often there can be synergies as well with regard to concentrated solar power and the thermal. Mm -hmm. They use salts to use as a coolant. So, you know, often there might be interesting synergies between. Yeah, and that's kind of what I mean when I say you don't know where things are going to go because, you, you know, if you, if you develop materials that perform better in extreme environments, Environments, they'll have multiple applications and and there are other sorts of synergies too in terms of the uh, roles that different forms of energy play in our supply and you know the, the fact that you, you need things to balance off intermittency of renewables and what does that mean in terms of transmission technology and you've really got to you know look at it in a fairly integrated sort of way. Are you involved now in the uh, Czech Republic? From the MSRE days, there's this coolant salt. It's used in the intermediate loop. You know, Kirk has probably told you all about this. They're going to use it for experiments in the reactor and give us back information and data we can use. So. Do, will that mean you've depleted your reserve, or are you still? No, no, we've got quite a bit more. I can't remember the amount. There's about five, if I remember right, five drums. It's four times 75, then times five times that. So it's yeah, about. Uh, yeah. About, about yeah, about a, about a ton. It's very unique material, though, because it's lithium that's in it. Yeah, yeah. So I hadn't realized that the aqueous reactor was done here as well, and, and the fact that these were all liquid reactors, oh, does that have to do with the chemistry background of some of these? Yeah, yeah, so the lab was operated, you know, if you operated by a chemical engineering company, uh, and so that has a lot to do with it. Wigner was a chemical engineer. Uh, the lab was very strong in chemistry, and so when DOE moved, they basically in '48 declared Argonne as the lead lab for for nuclear reactors. They want, they maintained Oak Ridge as chemical engineering expertise. Nuclear engineering has always made heavy use of computer modeling, but most of the tools we have now uh, were were developed actually a long time ago. Uh, they're written in, in Fortran. For, for, yeah, <laughs> Fortran 66 or you know maybe Fortran 77, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, and so um, you know modernizing that I think will be valuable even, even for new directions. For the nuclear industry for the most part I think it's fair to say they're really not interested in yeah. novel concepts. Uh, they have problems today that they want some help with and, and uh, uh, you know, DOE is partly responsive to their needs. For ORNL, I mean, given your heritage and given your aims, which are, you know, they're broadly written and, and they give you a lot of scope, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how much sort of um, you can influence DOE, you know, going back yeah. up the chain. Mm -hmm. You know, we're designed to respond to the priorities that are set by the government. On the other hand, we have a lot of technical expertise that can influence those priorities, and so there's a you know there has to be kind of a dialogue that goes on. Uh, we don't have, uh, I mean, I said our budget is 1.65 billion dollars. That there's no line in the federal budget that says Oak Ridge National Lab 1.65 billion go do good things. Mm -hmm. uh, my job would be very different if that were the case. <laughs> that could be uh, much more scope. You know, we we're funded through literally thousands of projects that come down from DOE and other government agencies where they say we need you to go do this, we need you to go do that, and, and we have to be 
responsive to that. You know, we don't set the policy framework, but to the extent that there's a kind of technology-based input into that, we do influence it. You know, through things like the advisory boards and uh, that, that DOE has, and, and national academy studies, and that sort of thing. If we discover new things, yeah. you know, our researchers come up with new ideas, and those have to somehow be factored back into the the future directions for the country. And that's one reason why we exist. Maybe we don't get directly funded for that, but it's a, it, we we are to do those sorts of things. What could ORNL do to sort of like get us back to that sort of discussion about what's the the step change in reactor design that will give us sort of safe, low waste? I mean, what's your personal thoughts on ORNL playing a, a greater role in in bringing uh, the molten salt reactors back to sort of just a you know modern day part of the modern day suite of solutions? Certainly, in the U.S. right now, we are embarking on a fairly significant debate around the direction for nuclear driven by two things, Fukushima and also in our case the, this uh, Blue Ribbon Commission that's been looking at the waste question which is currently unresolved in a kind of spectacular way. I guess that's a fair way to <laughs> describe it. Um, and, and so uh, there, there is a big discussion about you know, what these two things mean and there's some clear from, from our point of view, I think there's some clear directions come out of it. For example, there's a lot of interest in um, what are variously called uh, accident tolerant fuels. You know, what, what can you do to fuel design that makes it uh, more robust in the event of, of some unforeseen accident? And, and uh, that, you know, gets back to the issue in Fukushima with the zircaloy where you go to elevated temperatures and you initiate this reaction that, that releases the hydrogen that led to the explosions. And if you could have fuels that would uh, go to higher temperatures, you would buy more time in your emergency response to restore uh, site power. Um, and some of those ideas actually come out of programs that were driven by novel reactor concepts. So one of them is that we've been involved in is this triso fuel, which is the silicon carbide encapsulated spheres that was driven, I guess, out of the pebble bed modular reactor concept. Well, that may also be a useful fuel design even for light water reactors in this sort of post-Fukushima environment. With the Blue Ribbon Commission report, we, you know, we thought that kind of, if you look at the recommendations, they're really focused more on legislative things than technical solutions. It doesn't say a whole lot about technical. Um, though I would argue, you know, we probably pretty much have 90% of the technology uh, available, but the discussion has been is what's waste and what's not waste. And so what we've been trying to do is, is get the discussion going in a different way where it's not just sort of focused strictly on a, sort of a narrow view around isotopics and is there fissile material that's useful to, in, in the sort of the today economics, but kind of look at the bigger picture and say, and change the discussion and say, you know, s at some point where we're going to want to reprocess likely. And, and we ought to hold that option open. In the 40s and for much of the 50s, there were significantly lower estimates of uranium reserves than are known today. So they were very, very focused on the scarcity of fissile material. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, they sort of knew that there was going to be a, a cold, well, they didn't know there was going to be a cold war. They knew there was going to be some kind of confrontation with the Soviet Union after the war. So they felt like what U-235 was available was going to be, mm -hmm. you know, taken by the military. So mm -hmm. for for peaceful nuclear power, they felt like there had to be alternatives, and that's why they were very interested in, in things like the thorium fuel cycle, because they thought that might be a way that you could develop um, electrical power uh, without trying to compete for a, a share of the scarce uranium resource. Right now, it's still cheaper to dig it out of the ground and refine it than it is to reprocess it. So there's no, there's no economic real economic driver for a closed fuel cycle of any sort, whether it's, you know, thorium-based or uranium-plutonium-based, because it's just cheaper to mine it. That situation won't continue forever, given global demand and finite resource. But that crunch is far enough out that it's very, very difficult for governments to deal with. And so that's... Yes, that, that may be true yeah. about the fuel cycle, but the two crunches you've mentioned, which yeah. are safety, which has now taken a much higher priority, the inherent safety of the reactor design and economic crunch. 
you know, because why aren't we building lots of new nuclear reactors? It's because they cost a lot. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the, the, the sort of challenge for the nuclear industry is to find something that sort of ticks as many boxes as possible, perhaps the two primary ones being cost and safety. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you've got stuff that's happened here in the past that points in a direction that can answer those questions. Um, I'm just interested to see, you know, what it would take to kind of get back to those days where ORNL was building 13 test reactors, you know. <laughs> it's, that, it's, it's, you know, I, know it's, I probably will never go back to those days for lots of reasons, but it would be nice to sort of see ORNL regaining that role of, um, you know, really let's work out what's the best way to do this. Well, and that's partly why we're trying to, you know, drive some of this discussion around the Blue Ribbon Commission. And, and I, I personally think that it's, it's an appropriate time for, certainly for DOE, to reevaluate its R&D thrust within nuclear energy. And, and uh, you know, we have a structure now that was, you know, you could to some extent argue it was, it was set up uh, for a world that doesn't quite exist anymore. There's, I guess it's about $785 million a year or something that DOE invests in the nuclear energy programs. And so, you know, that's a lot. It's not what it was back in the day in inflation adjusted to dollars, but it's still, uh, you can do a lot with it. And, and um, there's enough that's changed in terms of, you know, economic drivers, environmental drivers, safety drivers, and so forth. Now it's, you know, it's tricky to move any large uh, organic bureaucracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, to the extent that the technology options can help inform that, that's something that we can sort of push. Yeah, and, I, and I guess I would say, you know, just to maybe to complete the discussion, the, the other piece that we haven't talked about that's important around the, the fuel cycle reactors and it is just nuclear materials in general and the security aspects of that and what is an appropriate program in terms of of maintaining expertise and knowledge relative to nuclear materials. If you're in the nuclear game, you're going to have expertise that's relevant for for uh, you know you proliferation. Decouple. You can't completely decouple. You, you know, you can never defend yourself from someone who's going to develop the technological capability, you know, over here and then some underground over there do something else using the expertise they have. But at least you can sort of make it so that it's hard to do them in the same place at the same time. Yeah. And I think that's <coughs> true of more than just nuclear. I mean, chemical and biological weapons are also part of this equation. And often nuclear gets singled out as being the, but you know, you can do a lot of damage with lots of other industrial applications. Yeah, that in some cases are much cheaper, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hello, David. Uh, David leads our salt-cooled reactor work, Excellent. so he's going to talk about that. This is Kevin Robb. He's in our thermohydraulics <laughs> group. Nice so he's helping with the, the design and, and analysis of our salt loop that David will show you here. Uh, basic message is that liquid salts are an outstanding heat transfer media. It really doesn't matter what you're going to be heat transferring heat for, whether this be a solar uh, power tower, uh, whether this be a salt-cooled reactor, a molten salt reactor, we are trying to demonstrate some of the core technologies you have to have to make liquid salts a standard heat transfer material. The idea of this loop to retain our expertise in using high temperature salts, to provide a platform for us to test different components, different reactor concepts. Above about 600 C, it becomes technologically very difficult to transfer heat effectively. The loop is designed to run at 700 Celsius. That's about 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. And the whole loop is made out of Inconel 600. Ideally, for salts, you'd use an alloy like Hasselhoff N. Right now, you can't really get uh, the right components, the right shapes using Hasselhoff N. So we use Inconel 600. It's maybe not the best option, but it's the economical and uh, available option. Currently, the loop is designed to run on Flinac. Uh, it has pretty similar properties to Flybe. It's just a different salt with a different uh, composition. Uh, the main purpose of the, the enclosure is to keep the heat inside. So the loop is designed to be about 200 kilowatts and at 700 C, that's pretty hot. And rather keep the heat in here and out the, out the ceiling instead of trying to air condition the room with 200 kilowatts. <laughs> right. Now do you use that for heating or just for heat containment? Meaning is all the heat localized on the pipes or do you heat the whole box? Yeah, all the heating is, is in the pipes, well, either in the pipes or on, on the outside of the pipes. All the pipes will be insulated with about four inches of insulation so the loop should stay fairly well insulated but it's still it's a fairly large loop and, and pretty hot there will be a crucible here about six foot so pretty big a nickel that's where we'll initially load the salt pass hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen through it and that will clean out the oxides and the different 
uh, contaminants inside the salt. So once the salt's clean, we'll pump it into the storage tank that's here. And this is designed where the salt is allowed to freeze inside of it. So that's a, an issue with salts where you can't have it just freezing inside of pipes, expands, breaks. So this, the salt will be stored in here. It's trace heated. You can see like little coils of heating tape. So we'll heat the whole loop up. We'll pressurize this container and pump the salt into here. And then within here is a pump. will be a, a motor mounted up top, a long shaft. And then the bottom here is the, the impeller of the pump. And there's a little picture of it here. It's currently out being assembled. The salt will be pumped through a test section, silicon carbide pipe almost. It, currently it's upside down. So if you, if you imagine it flipped around upside down and then inserted in this spot here. And there's a couple, couple different ideas of this test. One is uh, you often hear about silicon carbide being used for these high temperature reactors. And this is actually trying to use it as one of the big, I mean, it's a fairly large section, trying to use it as a structural component. Uh, so there's some challenges with how do you attach it, keeping it sealed. It has a different uh, thermal expansion, so it's, it's kind of tricky to, <laughs> to actually use. So this one proof of concept of actually using silicon carbide as a uh, structural member. Um, the other part of this test is we're going to fill it full of these little graphite spheres. You can touch one if you want. They're about three centimeters. And we'll fill it up about this, this much, just kind of illustrating how many of these uh, 600 spheres will be inside of it. And the idea is we're testing a reactor concept where th these would be, the fuel would be inside these pebbles, uh, fuel pebbles in here. And that's where the fission and the heat heat's created. And you got flowing fly over it. We're using an inductive power supply, which would be located on the outside here. So it comes in kind of through the wall here around the test section and it inductively heats the pebbles. Without using fission, it's kind of the only way to really get heat into the system. Instead of having rods and wires all going inside of it, it's, uh, it pretty well mocks up what an actual uh, one of these channels would perform like. Can I ask um, yeah. what the um, theory was between uh, around using a sort of a solid fuel pebble into the fly rather than dissolving the actinide into the salts? Currently in this country, we're not really looking at the molten salt uh, fueled systems. So the driver from a from a programmatic research was either a solid fuel or the or the pebble. But there must be some advantages to doing the solid fuel, or it's just it's just an extension from previous research study, really. This supports you know the salt cooled reactor project. One of those one of the concepts of the pebble bed. So it's still relevant to that project. So it could, you could get an aqueous fuel. In this system, in this uh, you wouldn't put fuel in no. it. We wouldn't fuel it. Not, uh, not, not, it's not, not this system mm. in this building. Yeah. But, but this is the base for an awful lot more of our testing. For example, we'll be doing natural circulation safety testing uh, within this is the next set of testing. We're doing a lot of corrosion specimens in here in a pump loop. Uh, loop. There are a uh, number of things for the next, uh, I figure the next decade. We will continue to use this as a base for our, our system. And you just happen to hit the, the timing such that the induction power supply is out being serviced, the pump is out being serviced uh, here. Uh, we're expecting by the end of September to have the loop pretty well ready to heat up. So a lot of the applicability of, of the uh, molten salt fuel systems or can be tested also in this system. Yeah, back when they were developing the molten salt reactor, they had numerous, numerous loops that were not fueled. Uh, these were ranged from natural circulation test loops, from material testing to pump systems like this. Ah, so, so they're all, okay. all very relevant. Tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Silicon carbide, even though we're using that as part of the design, that's part of the test. We're going to find out how that performs in a salt environment now. Mm. Now, and there are a number of, of tech, technologies that have never been done before in salt in here. That rotating flange up there to allow things to shift between there, the, the fact that we've got ceramic and metal pieces all in a single loop, the joints, which are the nickel uh, carbon based joints, so we can actually use gasketed seals. Most of the technologies that for a molten salt reactor in the, as far as the thermal hydraulics, well, they're identical. If you want to use the salt as a coolant, it's just much, much, much easier to do something that's non-radioactive uh, on this. So that's why we have the walk before you fly, uh, fly in here, that, that these may be a, quite a good, good way of starting, which is why the Chinese are also starting with the uh, saying that you go, use a solid fuel system before you go to a liquid fuel system.
th this one does uh, flow. So as the salt flows through it, okay. um, it actually sends sound waves through. So there will be a piece of electronics here, and here sends a sound wave through, and okay. then. Uh, depending how fast the salt's flowing through it, yeah. it kind of like the car going by and it yeah, makes yeah. a different sound. Yeah, Doppler yeah, effect, there you go. And that and it measures the Doppler shift. Nice. Kevin, mention the fluidic diodes, uh, what you can do yep. with that. Uh, so these are fluidic diodes. And basically, simply put, it's a way to control a liquid flow without using like a valve. Part of a safety system that's used in uh, the molten salt reactor, I believe, had them, and also liquid metal reactors where during normal operation, the flow goes one direction through it. So it would flow, in normal operation, it goes this way, it comes in this side and out this side. And that creates a lot of uh, resistance. It spins around and comes out. During an accident, the flow reverses and goes this way. And there's not a lot of resistance going from here, just flowing out here, because it doesn't spin around. So that's the, after the particle bed uh, concept test, the, that's the next set of tests, is to test this idea for the safety system. And then there's a heat exchanger. That's another part of the test. Look, salt goes, so you put, add the heat over there, you remove it here. There's a big, you can see the ducts, air flows through it, cools it down, and it goes back. And so here is some of just Flynac. This is what the fluoride salts fly. It actually looks almost identical to this. If you go ahead and you, do, and you repeat doing things in here, you can see, you start, you can see it starts to etch wow. the glass just a little bit. Well, etching the glass is uh, a matter of that you've set it in the Tennessee moisture, and, the t and that means that, well, it starts to etch quartz uh, on there because quartz is an oxide. Now, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, so it would seem that lithium fluoride would be the preferred chemical form rather than like lithium oxide. Is that the case? You will have a, okay. you will get a, you will get an equilibrium distribution. You provide oxygen uh, to this, and you because remember this is a solution, and when it's in a solution, you'll have some uh, oxygen and some fluorine, both of them in the solution, and you would like to keep, keep this thing as bound as possible. And as a matter of fact, you want to keep one of the things that keeps fly from being even as corrosive as flynac is it forms complexes in there, and oxygen will certainly interfere with its ability of forming complex. The favorable chemical form is still the fluoride. If you've ever gone ahead and had to remove uh, the rust from your bumper uh, on there, fluorines are really good at uh, getting rid of the uh, getting rid of the that uh, that chrome oxide. As you can, uh, and that's just it's a very effective technique. The, uh, that says corrosion in a fluorine salt is, is a very simple uh, process, or at least comparatively simple, uh, if you can keep it in the neutral uh, state. Uh, and then remember, all the metals in their deposited form are in their most reduced state. So what we have to do in, the re in a reactor is keep things very highly reducing. Uh, that's much like in the uh, molten salt reactor experiment. They use the ratio of uranium-3 to uranium-4 as a means to control uh, the redox potential, which went ahead and shifted the uh, and uh, changed the and uh, was just a simple way of con controlling the corrosion. Uh, we can also just put direct contact with the beryllium metal. If you put extra beryllium in there, there'll be a little bit more beryllium than there is fluorine on uh, here, and that will mean. Uh, if there's a free fluorine atom, essentially giving you a preferred spot to rust. And it, so this is all about controlling the potential corrosion of the salts within its it, within it, any vessel that you put it in. Yep, and it also because things like heat exchanger tubings are very thin walled, and if you don't prevent the corrosion, you get things like uh, the, the the iron out of the in the, some of the the alloys is more soluble at higher temperatures, and so you will get your heat exchanger where it's at hot temperatures, you will get uh, some of the metals taken out of solution, and then in about, uh, as it gets to the colder end, uh, and it'll redeposit, and so you can self-plug your heat exchangers, uh, it, which you would very much like not to do, and your, your technique to avoid that is to go ahead and keep everything in, uh, I think, very well reduced so it doesn't corrode in the first place. But the point I wanted to just make sure everybody understands is there are no strong chemical reactions that are going to take place between the salt and even direct contact with water. You'll make Indeed. it. You'll make it lousy. 
but you won't have a... Indeed, there's no fires, there's no gross things, but we are, and the reactors are part of our basic safety, is we're having no large volumes of water in our reactor to, in the, inside of containment, because I want to have a low pressure containment uh, on this, and if I had a large volume of water, uh, if I had a big enough accident, I could get the water in contact with the hot things, and that would allow me to pressurize containment and would, could lead to uh, you know, a, a, a much more serious accident. And we're starting to melt this, so you can start to see, uh, see as it's just becoming more, I mean, it's just becoming a little bit more like uh, liquid-like. Kind of get slushy. Yeah, slushy. Give it about, uh, once it gets started, it only takes about a minute to go ahead and and liquefy. This, the melt point of this is 454. Uh, melt point of FLIB is 459. So they're very similar salts. That's why you, you, you yeah, Celsius. Uh. Do you have any thorium samples here in the lab? Oh, there are a number of thorium samples around. The big issue is that if you haven't freshly separated the thorium, uh, it develops daughter products on there and it starts being something you don't want to hand around. The best way of getting thorium, frankly, is go down to the beach in Florida and just dig some sand. The, the, uh, the, the monazite sands are all over. Matter of fact, we use some of the monazite sands, which are in secular, secular equilibrium, as a, uh, as a radioactivity standard. Uh, uh, the standard, so they they are so thorium when it's thorium itself has you know, very little going out but in not too many years afterwards it's built in its daughter products and the daughter products have have as you know significant radioactivity signatures so we try not to hand those around to the uh, around to the guests uh, on there the also ones the, the biggest ones I actually had are from the we also had put in the you know, beam line at the Orella and once you put them in the beam line they were definitely not hand around you can sort of to see it looks like liquid. It's still kind of cloudy. We got to wait, wait another minute or two for it to clear out. Uh, uh, but basically, it's water. The viscosity on it is 30 times larger, but water is very low viscosity. So it's still a very low viscosity fluid. It's interesting because I think some people might imagine this is quite a gloopy or kind of slow moving liquid, but it's actually quite fluid. It does go through a melt much like a glass as opposed to water which doesn't quite do that so we do don't want to run the reactor you know at 460 c because you're right it's kind of tar like on, on here so we want to run it a couple of hundred or 100 c or so above uh, this and i would like to even in, in all cases have it at least 50 c so it does flow nicely it's not like water or a liquid metal where one degree over uh over melting in it's uh and it's a very well flowing fluid and we're not losing anything through volatility right now. Anything is, is in science terms is tough to say. There are a few atoms that are coming off of this, but it, both it's not toxic and uh, yeah. No, sodium you can hand around, but you certainly would not like to go ahead and heat it up in air uh, like this. This would not be a good idea. And you can see it just moves just like water. I say the hazards on this is the same thing as you have hazards on a deep fat fryer, which is why we don't, in case I trip, throwing hot oil or hot salt in this case on visitors would be considered a bad thing uh, here. But there's nothing else uh, else to this uh, as there. It just makes a nice little clear liquid. But I'll just go ahead and pour this out into a little stainless steel crucible and you could hear that little snap there was just, there was a little bit of moisture at the bottom of the uh, stainless steel there. And it just is re-solidifying, uh, solidifying here. I mean, at 450, I mean, this thing is a solid. So it doesn't take very long for it to form the, 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 a solid again. Isn't that a nice feature? <laughs> it just... It's literally difficult in, the, uh, in a reactor to actually have a loss of coolant accident, even, you know, what's one of our issues about designing it so we can pump it out if we ever wanted to, is that it solidifies. And, oh, I see. You know, it gets too inert too quickly. And it just forms a plug and, well, you can't drain it anymore because it made a plug. But now in the scenario of a leak, if you had this leak out into a containment room, a containment vessel at, you know, the containment vessels at room temperature and the salts coming out at you know, 700 C, it's going to depend on the volume of the mass that comes out. We but. have designed in our system a guard vessel on here, which is just a stainless steel, half inch thick stainless steel vessel. Um, we don't know if you had a major rupture on this, you know, it's a huge crack across the thing, even worst case, which you, of course, you know, thanks to the boiler and pressure vessel code and there are people in the 1910s who died from all this. Well, no one's ever had one of the, these types of things, but even if you did, it would just uh, go into the next level, uh, guard vessel and sit there. Uh, but if you had a little crack on this and it was sort of it was starting to weep, it forms a plug.
and it'll just form a plug. Self-plug. It'll self-plug. On the other hand, if your design keeps the vessel hot, it'll stay liquid on there. But I mean, that's why you have a guard vessel, and it's a guard vessel, and it's a fairly inexpensive thing because you're. It's only for an emergency on here, so it's only sort of half-inch stainless steel to catch the whole thing. If if you know absolute worst case happens and you have massive vessel rupture, well, you still catch it. You have your conventional solid fuel with a liquid coolant, you know, an, uh, a fixed fuel form with a liquid flowing by it. Your pebble bed is a little bit of a transition in that the pebbles can kind of percolate up through so you get some movement of the fuel. Then your next step is a slurry where you've got smaller particulate moving with the flow. And then the final step is actually just the fuel in solution. You can almost imagine a continuum with the pebbles just getting smaller until finally they're in solution. These are steps towards oh, yeah, yeah. a full solution. We'll talk about a little bit lunch, yeah. different reactor yeah. concepts. Consortium for Advanced Simulation of uh, Light Water Reactors, Castle. Oh, wow. I like how everyone else sees what <laughs> I mean, it, right? it's, Yeah, it's not the same, you know, unless you have those on. Yeah, yeah this is the set you want. Yeah, so you're walking, so you could have a molten salt reactor that you could walk around on. Not only are we modeling reactors on computers, but we've been, been, in fact, by DOE said, you must select and model physical reactors, show that it's relevant to actual operating reactors, not, not, a, not a design that isn't operating yet. Oh, this is so cool. You guys have got to try this. Oh, goodness, that makes you feel really weird. <laughs> There's something in front of me here, it feels like. We're focusing on pressurized water reactors in the core of a pressurized water reactor, and that's about 60% of the U.S. fleet. Uh, but in general, the simulation technology we're putting together uh, will be, we expect it to be broadly applicable to a large class of reactors. The, the reason to focus on PWRs now is um, we've got an existing fleet out there with lots of data, and we can, we can really uh, execute a proof of principle uh, in comparing with existing reactors, but also they have some challenges moving forward that, uh, that we feel like we want to want to help them with. So what are the problems that uh, current reactors are facing that you're trying to solve? Advanced fuels, new fuels that are less, uh, that are more tolerant and resistant to uh, accident scenarios like loss of coolant, and in this case, uh, cladding integrity. This calculation here is looking at a fuel pellet that might have a chip in it, and what would happen is that you operate with a chip in your, a fuel pellet, what would happen to the cladding and the stress on the cladding. This actually shows what holds the fuel rod steady. If you get a gap in here, the rod can vibrate and wear a hole. Could you talk a little bit uh, for our guests' benefit about the versatility of this with regards to other reactor types, particularly like MSRs? I want to claim that at least 80% of what we have done within Vera is applicable to um, almost any reactor. So if you go to MSRs or, or BWRs, you've got to worry about a different type of coolant and different geometries, but you still have neutrons, you still have heat transfer, you still have structural mechanics and all that base technology. The current tools that are used do homogenize things and that's, they're able to do that because a lot of very bright people figured out the physics and able to come up with simplified models. That was necessary because computer power didn't exist to do things like what we're doing now. And in fact, the computer power now is just becoming online and with, with Jaguar and Titan 30 petaflops up to exaflops flop, we're getting to where we don't actually have to do the homogenization step. What's the main advantage to 3D modeling over cross-section modeling? What they actually do is they model a full assembly as a, as a single node, or actually it's a quarter assembly. Uh, so at the core level, they are not modeling all the detailed rods. Those are done in a pre-processing step that you model all the rods, you homogenize it, put it in a 3D model that models part of the fuel assembly as a homogenous piece. So you get basically one one number for a quarter of this assembly. And then you have to construct out of that the detailed rod distribution. And, the, and where that becomes important, you can look at some of these assemblies like this one. It has hot rods here and, and sort of nominal rods here. You like to be able to pick up that direct interaction between these assemblies in a 3D calculation. So there's some physics that we're picking up directly in our 3D model that in current methods are actually picked up you know, in a pre-processing step and reconstructed. So how do you know this is right? Right, so you're modeling a, in a physical system. So reason we're picking physical reactors because they actually do some measurements in the plant. So these white areas are control rod guide tubes, and the center one of these is called an instrument tube, and they can run an, uh, a, a fission detector down that instrument tube and get an axial power distribution. So we can compare that, and for the assemblies that they do those measurements on, we can compare overall um, power of the assemblies. For the detailed power of the individual rods, we have to go to, to very dedicated experiments called critical experiments where they actually do rod 
rod by rod power measurement. So we have to use data like that to put together to come up with a oh thank you come up with a, a validation case uh, for this. Are there any additional modules required to do a fully homogeneous liquid fuel form reactor with castles? Yeah, you'll need a, you'll need the chemical processing module if you want to do that. We've got the physics, we, radiation transport, fluid flow. A lot of it is infrastructure as far as, uh, and we're going through a lot of that now even for LWRs. How do you specify the geometry? How do you specify the flow? How do you tell it at what rate to process the, the fuel? Things like that. But the fundamental aspects are there. The physics is there. This uh, timeline dates from maybe 10 years ago now when, the, when people were talking about what's beyond generation three plus and, and the idea was generation four. And here's some of the attributes, economical, enhanced safety, minimizing waste and proliferation resistance. So that was the reactor picture. And if we look at what we're, we've built and what we're building right now, what's happened to the size of the reactors over time. This is a plot for every reactor built in the United States. It's power level over time. First reactor shipping port, you can see here was, was uh, I think it was like 60 megawatts, if I remember right. And they, they sort of hovered around the 200 megawatt level and then they started scaling up. You know, there's a principle that economics of scaling versus power level and size. The last plant that went online in the United States is right here, Watts Bar. These would all be considered large plants. These would be considered small size. You can see we really didn't focus on building anything small after the 1970s because we wanted to improve the economics of nuclear power. The cost of a plant, which may be on the order of $5 billion, is a larger capitalization than the value of the utility that would pay to, to buy that. So there's a lot of partnering that goes on. Very significant economic investment, usually a company is almost betting their future on the success of this plant. And that's raised a lot of issues about whether that's, a, that's really a sustainable deployment uh, means in the U.S. all based on private capital. The potential answer is small modular reactors, sort of a generation three plus plus that's gonna actually fill this gap. Larger deployment because the economics are favorable. And that would bridge us into advanced reactors, these gen four like concepts. Here's some terminology of what's meant by an SMR. These are the IEA definitions. So it's less than 300 megawatts electric, it's small. Three to 700, it's medium, and greater than 700, large. So this includes, of course, research and test reactors. Uh, SMR, some people use this to mean small and medium reactors, and so those would be reactors less than 700 megawatts. United States, and this is becoming more common everywhere, SMR means small modular reactor, so you have less than 300 per module, and you may build multiple modules at one site to get a larger power plant. To, and that, the multiple modules actually gives you a lot of flexibility as far as when you build things and how you capitalize things. Uh, load demand, you can add these as you need them in small increments and follow your load demand, making that investment as you go along in time to manage your demand growth. And then you can also match these up against other sources, intermittent sources, uh, through load following to provide power. Uh, if you look in the U.S., this is a chart of the age distribution of our coal plants less than 30 megawatts, 30 to 60, up to greater than 500 megawatts. And the blue is greater than 50 years old, the red is less than 50 years old. And if you look at about the 300, all of our plants that are greater than 50 years old that are reaching their lifetime are less than 300 megawatts. So that matches the size for a small modular reactor, making it very, a very nice fit that if you, when you shut down these coal plants, because not only because of age, but because maybe you want to uh, reduce the carbon emissions that you, you can bring in a small modular reactor and place them. It's the right size. And we have a, a reactor concept called advanced high temperature reactor. David will talk about this next based on salt coolant. And this is a small modular version we call Smarter. Graphite moderated core with triso fuel fly coolant. It has, it's an integral design. It has integral heat exchangers, primary heat exchangers and decay heat removal heat exchangers. It's 125 megawatts. It would use fly, atmospheric, you know, all the benefits of salt. And it's got uh, you know, redundant heat removal system, rate and power conversion. This would be a small modular salt cooled reactor. Um, are those solid fuel rods that are in the center? They're not rods, they're plates. And they use um, triso fuel, the little coated particle fuel. This is a small reactor, I want to point this out. This is a scaled version compared to the new scale in B&W. 
this is smarter. This is 50 megawatts electric, 45 megawatts electric, 125 megawatts electric. And you can see this is quite a bit smaller. And it's not because the core is smaller. This is the core here, and this is the core down here. Why it's smaller is because the heat exchanger is a lot smaller. You can see that to, to, when you go to steam generators, they take up this whole volume here. When you go from salt to salt, the heat exchanger is a lot more compact, so you save a lot of space there. This is a uh, diagram of a plant layout of a molten salt reactor. And uh, these are 250 megawatt units. This was for their two fluid design, if you're familiar with what that means. You have a module that contains a cell for a reactor. And you've got heat exchangers. You've got steam generators out here. You've got dump tanks in here. And uh, a storage area here. And this would actually form a module. If you put four of these things together, you can have four modules on a site. So this is a small modular reactor. And it's got, here are your four modules. And then you've got some shared system, which is shared salt processing system. So it's one of the first small modular reactor concepts uh, developed. Uh, later, they went on to build, go after a one gig gigawatt class design. But originally, it was a 250 megawatt small modular design. Yeah, we get all of our power from TVA. They've proposed building an impower reactor at this Clinch River site. You're sitting right in here. Clinch River site is right here. This is where they were going to build the breeder reactor. And they proposed building uh, uh, B&W reactors on this site right here. And they've engaged the NRC as far as scheduling. The issue, you know, is national labs don't build reactors. They're built by companies. And you have to go through a lot of design, qualification, demonstration to get there. So if you were to look at a deployment schedule for the Gen 4 designs, and that's why I put that, that slide up first, those may not be ready till 2030 or 2040. So we need something now to add to our grid which, with clean nuclear power that's going to get us to these advanced designs. And that relies heavily on the light water established technology that was a light water reactor. But it, but it seems to be quite odd because it implies us some sort of inherent um, process that we're going through that was dictated from on high. But actually all of those timings are just a function of how much money and resource you put into, into each element. As far as the uh, Gen 4 systems, I mean there is a point at which you can't accelerate them beyond the technology development, qualifying the fuel. So like creep testing for, ma for materials takes a fixed period of time. If you put more money at it, you can't compress the time for long-term creep testing. Um, you know, the NRC, you mentioned NRC license requirement. That takes a set number of years to get that done. You can't put more money on that and get that done any faster than that. So there are, you do reach a point where you just can't, you know, push it any harder. I, I think you need to get started. <laughs> the way you compress the time is you get started uh, aggressively toward you know answering those questions and and uh, you know we we kind of cycle politically uh, up and down and you know at some point uh, I'm convinced nuclear has got to be a part of the solution uh, you know water is going to be a problem I mean there's just many things that uh, nuclear is going to have to fill the void in so so getting the, the will to actually just get started and doing material studies and testing of uh, different concepts and so forth will always draw that front line back. And, you know, I'm reminded, the, you know, I always say the neutron was discovered in 1932, right, by Chadwick. And think about how far we came mm -hmm. in nuclear technologies over one generation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we could come just, you know, if we could even get close to that over one generation, a lot of these things that we're looking at would be solved. And it, it takes political will to do. It's a bit like the discussion around fusion. You know, people always joke that fusion is always 50 years away, right? It always has been and for more than 50 years. And, and partly that's because of the point that you raise, which is it's not correct to talk about it in terms of years away. You know, it's a question of how much you invest. So at some given point in time, people will lay out, we need to do this and this and this and this. If you actually did those, you know, at the end of 50 years, you might get a huge But of course, what happens is you don't do them. The plans change, the resources change. And, and so it's more, you know, a series of technological challenges away, which at a given level of investment, you can accomplish in, you know, 50 years, maybe 30 years, maybe 100 years, maybe never. Mm. Uh, but there is a piece of it, just like uh, Jess was saying, that, that that's incompressible, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because of the, you know, we, we live in a regulatory environment where you have to do in-situ testing of things. And 
that's got a cycle associated with it because you've got to do the test and then you've got to wait for things to cool down and you've got to do an examination you've got to make a decision based on what you learn for the next test and you know that's got an in intrinsic time scale to it that more resources don't overcome now there are other parts of it that are absolutely resource limited mm. and you could go at more aggressively mm. and you know the trick is to not not get out in front of it you mm. know what you wouldn't want to do is throw resources at the problem faster <coughs> than you know the intrinsic time limit because you know in the end you'd squander a bunch of money but you could also you know spend a lot of money and never get there if you if you bring it down too low mm. it's like looking at building projects right with, with eater we could the u.s is responsible for the u.s contribution to eater we could spend a hundred million dollars a year and never do it mm. uh, you know you've got to ramp it up to Mm. 300 million dollars or something in order to just be able to get over the hump of getting it done. You know, the other, the other thing, if you look in the U.S. and you go back 10 years on nuclear power, everybody basically thought we're going to shut down the plants, we're going to put the fuel in Yucca Mountain and move on to other things. That's totally different now. And uh, as far as where we are and looking in the future, change, you know, five, you know, a gradual change over 10 years to where it back again in to our future and in some ways things are accelerating in some ways they're not you have other other events that happen you got Fukushima you have economy downturn you have a number of things that this all fits together two dollar a thousand BTU yeah, that's that's a huge yeah, that impact. Thing, yeah. <laughs> and those are not in our control the other thing is you know things went very fast in the 40s and 50s not only because of the regulatory environment because but also because they were not developing commercial nuclear power they're de developing it just get a reactor up, show that it works, do experiments. We're, nuclear technology is well beyond that now. It's commercial production <laughs> technology, and uh, so you have to do things differently than we did back then. Our first MSR went online five years after the concept came, but it only operated for nine days. Yes, you know, we can compress the scale and we could have something running at very short periods of time, but that's not what we're looking for now. We're looking to be a preferred source for energy for the nation, and that takes the more time. But what's encouraging about what you just said is that you can test out reactor designs relatively quickly before hurtling off down a new route that, you know, perhaps if we'd had a bit more experimentation <coughs> at this stage, when, when I think you're right, the debate is opening up, there is a different set of there are a different set of parameters. And then the other thing, I'll say this before Tom does, is the modeling simulation now is actually a, a whole new tool of where, what we really didn't even have just a few years ago. And that's why all the excitement about CAS and what you just saw mm. becomes, becomes a lot a lot easier way to look at all these design variations and narrow down what you actually have to do exp experiments on. So. Identify a few dead ends on the computer. Yeah. You'll still have to do the testing, you'll still have to do the prototyping. It doesn't replace it completely, mm -hmm. but it can hopefully, you know, narrow down the possibilities so that the resource demands aren't so high. This is the U.S. salt reactor prog uh, program I'll be talking about. I both lead the ORNL uh, reactor program working for, uh, for Cecil in this room and up through the chain, uh, as well as I'm the U.S. rep in the International Molten Salt Reactor Program the in the, through the Gen 4 uh, consortium. So the U.S. is electing to go after a salt-cooled reactor at first. It is not to say that the U.S. doesn't recognize that molten salt reactors have some very interesting, advantageous capabilities, but they are a more technically challenging thing to do. And that much for the same reason that the Chinese are pursuing a salt-cooled reactor before uh, they, they go after a, uh, the true molten salt reactor. That's the same uh, uh, reason the U.S. is following. As a matter of fact, in the last meeting just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the French representative for their molten salt program also acknowledge they would probably want to be building a salt cooled reactor before they went into a salt fueled reactor it's just this much simpler system so what is a fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor essentially it uses coated particle ceramic fuel we'll, we'll show you some pictures of it that's the triso uh, fuel uh, uses a fluoride salt as a primary coolant it's pool type basically a swimming pool with loops and, and heat exchangers around that. And as you point out, it's a big part of why they're cheaper. Swimming pools aren't multi-inch thick forgings on here. It's a swimming pool. It's a high temperature reactor. It's both for the efficiency and for the fact that the salts don't melt uh, until around 450 C. Our definition for strong passive safety in this is there's no requirement for an active response to avoid either core damage or larger offsite release 
following even severe accidents, and that's ever. This isn't three days. This is this is ever. If if it just goes black, uh, black, we don't, you don't have to do anything. Fluoride salt reactors take. Uh, bits and pieces from all of the other reactor classes just because we've come after them. Whether it's the molten salt reactors where you learn things about the fluoride salt coolants, we've got a, uh, the same structural alloys, the hydraulic components, things like pumps, pipes, valves. While we would want very much to advance them from where they were in the 1960s, there'll be an identical transfer. The triso fuel, the gas-cooled reactors, the structural ceramics, it's a high temperature reactor. We look very much like that. But we also take from the liquid metal reactors, the passive decay heat rejection. The liquid metal reactors have been demonstrating the direct reactor auxiliary cooling systems uh, since the EBR2, which is in the 1960s time frame. Light water reactors, We've got a clear coolant. It looks an awful lot like water. It's got a high heat capacity. Basically, our coolant performs an awful lot like water at room temperature uh, here, which gives us a very convenient way of doing an awful lot of the prototypic modeling is just using uh, water. And we're also even taking from the advanced coal plants because they're the people who exist right now who have high temperature power cycles. And so we want to just copy the power cycles that already exist and not reinvent things that other people are doing. One of the things to point out, though, is with a high temperature reactor is that once you get a high temperature reactor, you can get into the hydrocarbon cycle. That is equally every bit as important as the electricity production. And you simply don't get there without getting to a high temperature reactor or without some very big efficiency penalties for just actually heating things up electrically. So that's it straight. The economy is a scale. Actually, I think they're large modular FHRs. I mean, if you look at how the AP-1000 is being produced right now in China, I was watching them winch in a 700 metric ton module into there, and everything is being built in factories, and they're just assembling the modules on site. It's, instead of having each module representing a plant, this thing, one plant is made up of several modules. So the modular concept applies equally well to large as well as it does to small plants. And so you get all the economies of factory fabrication. The small modular reactors, however, look like really effective local process heat uh, sources where you have things like, well, if you're trying to support a refinery and producing the hydrogen so you can at get 15% more gasoline out of your oil on this by adding hydrogen to it, well, if you want to get, match the size of the refinery, you don't want a great big reactor, and the refinery kind of wants you to follow and do exactly what they want to instead of what, you, you, what the grid people want to. So a small reactor really makes some sense, and you just don't want to put a great big reactor on an isolated grid because he would make the whole thing unstable. Uh, say passive safety, again, no requirements for off-site power or cooling water is a big part of what, uh, of what we're looking for. And again, low pressure combined with high temperature, essentially low pressure containments. You know, don't need the meter thick concrete walls. It's just a building. Turns out we need to be below grade just simply because in today's environment, you've got to be able to protect against people flying large aircraft into you uh, on there. And you're not going to be able to do that unless you, unless you go below grade. However, this is the other uh, things. There's an awful lot of technology maturation that needs to be done. We are not ready for, uh, for commercial deployment. We're not even ready for test reactor deployment right yet. I'm hoping that we will be ready for test reactor in the relatively near term, but you will need to be able to provide adequate level of confidence in the technologies before this is going to be a multiple billions of dollars investments on a commercial part or government's part. And if you don't have some confidence that you're going to get a payback, no one's going to spend the money. A lithium isotope separation. We have to reindustrialize it. We already knew how to do it at a commercial level, and it would have uh, the mercury amalgam process would be perfectly commercially acceptable. It's not environmentally acceptable. There are a couple of other processes uh, about uh, simulated moving bed chromatography, as well as some interesting atomic laser uh, vapor isotope separations that are recent that look very promising, but they're not commercial. Uh, tritium extraction. We produce tritium because we're putting, we got light elements and neutrons nearby. Tritium goes through metals at high temperature at fairly rapid rates. We cannot put out radionuclides as a uh, into the public environment as a part of normal operations. If we can't capture and trap the tritium, uh, we can't operate. On the other hand, this is also an opportunity. It turns out this decays to helium-3, and there's a worldwide shortage of helium-3 for science experiments. And we could turn this into a valuable product once we go ahead and we, if you get this solved. Sorry, can I ask where, that, where is that happening already, that tritium extraction R&D? 
MIT is starting some university level studies on that. There have been a number of conceptual types of studies and there was work done as part of the MSRE program. Uh, I don't believe we will be following the same path that they did because our technologies, it's just been 40 years and we've got We've got some improved technologies that we think have high promise uh, for uh, for trapping the tritium. Some of this is of common interest with the fusion program as well. Very much so. We are. We are following an awful lot, we're taking advantage of the fact that the first wall of the fusion program was, was a leading candidate was in the, in the early part of the 2000s was actually FLYB. It's not currently their leading choice, but they did an awful lot of work with, uh, with this. And because they wanted to get the tritium out, because it's their fuel, they had to develop the, the tritium ex some of the tritium extraction technologies, and we're, we're going to be leveraging that heavily. Safety and licensing approach has to be developed and demonstrated. We're actually fairly easy in comparison to other things because we're a liquid-cooled system with, pa with very strong passive safety. We think that with some modification of the existing licensing technique, it'll be an evolutionary approach instead of a revolutionary approach to licensing. We have a good solid possibility of getting uh, a licensing done without nearly the set of hurdles that some of the gas reactors uh, that we were trying to do, which was a full uh, probabilistic base, which required the NRC to make a major mental change. And I sort of think of them as the battleship. Trying to steer them a, a, in a different direction is a lot of work. But they're a very good protector if you can get them to agree, agree that you are something that is correct. Structural ceramics, we absolutely have to have it as a high temperature reactor. It just does not make sense to put metals right next to the core uh, on this. We're so far, we, we are now getting to where things start creep f uh, failing at, the, at higher temperatures. And fortunately, the first structural ceramic was just approved for use in nuclear power. It's graphite, and we need more advanced things. But it's the first time somebody's actually gotten this through the ASME boiler and pressure vessel code as an engineering material. So that was something that wasn't available 40 years ago. So the technology is advancing. Again, uh, structured coated particle fuel has to be qualified. So not just the coated particles, we need it in a different form. Everything from this derives from that liquid salt. A large part, and the big number to see on here, it's the best one on here, is the volumetric heat capacity, which just says it's a really good heat transfer agent. It's even better than water. It absorbs a great deal of heat and very efficiently transfers that power. And with a boiling point of 1400 C, and we're operating at 700 C, we have this enormous margin to having any problems. And the fuel also takes even higher temperatures. And this compares very favorably with anything else that's in here. Is it just we are the preferred means of transferring heat, which is why everyone else is even looking in the solar areas, people want to be moving into the liquid salts as their, as their primary heat transport media. Okay, looking at these things for different types of applications. Okay, this is our AHTR, it's the below grade version of things, and this is the, the big reactor, 1500 megawatt central generating station, saying that there's an awful lot of the world that still is densely interconnected. Uh, industrial societies, and they need baseload power. It is very difficult for small modular reactors to come up with a way of saying that you're going to be cheaper. They can be the more financially uh, desirable because you can raise money in smaller increments, but it is just difficult to overcome the economy of scale. If you can build a big reactor and you can afford to do it, uh, do it, all of our models tell you build a big one. That does not mean that we are not also looking at small reactors because th those are financial realities. There are some university programs that are looking at a variety of different things, as well as the Chinese and the Indians, who are the, o the other international people who are interested in salt-cooled reactors of different scales. Uh, the HTR is the DOENE's primary program focus right now, and we're trying to go ahead and look at the concept to see what's the feasibility and understand the technology. as a, and, and DOE, we don't, don't build reactors. We go ahead and develop the technologies and try to support the in industry as they're doing that. And so we're using the, uh, the, tech, the concept development to sort of say, well, I have to have this, and I don't know how to do this. And we're trying to understand where are the technology developments to guide our R&D over the next decade or so. So say the large system, it's a po swimming pool reactor. We do have an external loop, but the external loop isn't involved in the safety. If you just sheared the external loop off entirely, it would still be, per uh, be uh, as, as, sa uh, as a safe reactor so that we don't have the accident consequences for this. The reactor vessels, 
couple inches thick. It, thick. It's not a forging. It's not a stru it's not major structural uh, material, so relatively easy to make. But it's a it's a classic uh, loop type reactor, and we're not really spending much time on this part of the reactor because other people need that. Uh, the, the unique parts are this part of the reactor where this is salt loop, and that's where we spend it. But I can go ahead and get a model for this from somebody and say, well, that's what a steam plant looks like and what our efficiency will look like because I can order one of those. Say 3,400 megawatt thermal, 1,500 megawatt electric. It's quite conservative in there. We're only going for a 45% efficiency. Other people have exotic power cycles hooked to those that can give you a, a much higher efficiency. But we're, again, well, that's not what we're emphasizing. Say a 50 degrees C across the core, much like a light water reactor. Uh, three loops, uh, primary coolants, FLIB. Uh, the uranium oxycarbide variant of TRISO, 9% enrichment. We're sticking with 9% because we think we can probably get our current uh, enrichment uh, plants to be able to provide us uh, that, and so we don't have to pay for people to build new enrichment facilities. So do any of these concepts address uh, the turndown, being able to do turndown effectively? That was always, if you look at the controls, they were always designed uh, with potential for load following. As a matter of fact, you can load follow with today's reactors. The issue comes out to be, and no one wants to load follow with your low-cost systems. Nuclear power plants tend to be very expensive to build and to maintain and to regulate, but they tend to be very inexpensive to operate, uh, which means that once you have one operating, uh, people want to keep them operating. And so that has not been a major focus of, of these programs, but we did have, have a variety of grid-appropriate reactors uh, thing, programs about three or four years ago when we were looking at how do you support grid stability? One of the um, interests on the part of uh, in the military world is having you know very small, um, you know, talking even like ten megawatts. And, and see, in those markets, they don't have as much. They aren't driven by the economics as much. And again, when we get to a certain amount, I'll tell you your best way of doing some of these things is ma is make diesel fuel using your reactor and run your and use your diesel fuel. <laughs> Small modular reactors, we are very interested in a transportable uh, size of these for some of the things like supporting individual refineries or remote power operations. If you look at how much in the tar sands and how, how much of their energy gets used in, in producing the, their product. Certainly these would be very interesting when the U.S. finally goes to oil shale as our production is that you need to cook the rocks, you need to heat the rock up to 600 C or so to do the refinery and get the, to liquefy the uh, oil shale. And just from the spatial nature of, uh, of the distribution, it's very difficult to have one large reactor and say, well, I want to do 100 square miles of space. It's just not structured correctly. Having a small reactor that you can move to where you need the heat is the appropriate form for that. We think the hydrogen production is, you know, sort of where, how you get into the hydrocarbon cycle because the carbon comes out of whether it's CO2, whether it comes out of coal. Uh, the closer it looks all right to your end product, the less amount of energy you have to do. But there was a nice seed money project that was done in a few years ago here, which comes out to a nice uh, uranium carbonate-based uh, cycle for the production of large amounts of hydrogen, which only needs 650C as a T-hot and doesn't have any high-pressure or hot, high-pressure, caustic, unpleasant chemicals within this, which is a very interesting cycle, which turns out fits our T-out of our reactor very nicely. And so we're hoping to be able to, over time, learn to couple the, our reactor into a hydrogen production cycle. Again, FHRs get both high quality is always important in a nuclear power plant, but a lot of this you get from inherent that you just have large margin to fuel fa uh, failure, good natural circulation uh, coolant, very good negative temperature reactiv uh, reactivity. It shuts itself off rather than going out of, out of control. Uh, high radionuclide solubility in the salt. That's, well, that source term Jess was talking about was, well, if you actually did have major fuel failure, well, you've converted your reactor into a molten salt reactor uh, if you go ahead and you fail all the fuel. <laughs> it's a low pressure system. There's no driving force to cause things to go outward on uh, in in this, uh, and which also helps you to make containment barriers, because I don't need containment barriers to be very strong. Turns out we're designing a thing with four layers of containment ba barrier because they're relatively easy to do. You put a stainless steel dome around things and you've got a containment barrier. But we still want to have high quality fuel. Of course you're not going to operate the thing if your fuel is leaking everywhere. Effective decay heat sinking to the environment. Again, 
we still have we're still either a uranium or a thorium system and it's going and it will have a substantial amount of decay heat when you turn it off and we need to be able to reject that to the local air or to the ground we're currently designing it to the air again passively thermally driven reactivity because we can heat up because we don't have this boiling issues go going on we can use things like fusible links you can set melt point alloys that are 10 or 15 or 20 degrees above your normal operating point and all your control rods are linked by a by a melt point to a melt point in there and just to let them passively drop in you can have a poison salt injection system which is just held shut by a melt point uh, system because we do have a lot more margin and that's something which is distinctive to us because we're not anywhere near uh, temperature limits uh, for short terms for anything we just let things heat up until you get to a melt point and you and you stick in a lot of negative reactivity you have hundreds of hours before you even get one in a million uh, type failures uh, at 1600 C if you've operated it at low enough temperatures uh, on this. There's a, there's a large volumetric change in the salt with temperature which says that our passive natural circulation cooling has got a very strong driving force which means that we can rely upon natural circulation which gives us the ability of making very large reactors because the natural circulation is not something which is limited that I have to wick stuff out to the side. I can go ahead and just continue to use normal types of cooling and just reject it to the uh, to the atmosphere, which says that my re upper limit on my reactor size is actually my grid, not my, my, not my reactor safety. Say so, the coolant viscosity also decreases with increasing temperature, which actually tends to reduce the hot spots, which is a, it's a nice feature to have, which is the opposite of helium. Now we were talking about plates as to why we're doing things. So essentially what we have are, uh, in our design are, they look like planks, about 25 millimeters thick, two layers of fuel right underneath. Uh, the reason we have these layers is because our method of rejecting heat is into the coolant. We don't want to wick things out through the walls. We want to reject it into the coolant because the natural circulation is the means by which we reject the heat, which says that we put the fuel as close as we can into the coolant. So if you're looking down from the top, We've got a, a, cent a central hanger. You actually have a control blade in each one of the fuel assemblies. And then there are 18 fuel assemblies arranged in a hexagonal grid. And one of our nice advantages is that we have this big MSR program to draw from. This actually configuration was came up with in 1968. We've been following that, and Jess was kind enough to point out one of the old reports. Well, gee, this was the configuration they had, and it was, certainly is an appropriate configuration. And so if you see this, it's actually a fairly long, uh, long thing. It kind of looks like a telephone pole if you look at it. It's about 47 centimeters across and about 6 meters tall, so it's a big core. So if you look at the core, we have 252 assemblies to configure it into making the core. And then there's a downcomer around this where the, the, the salt comes down and then goes up through the core that keeps the vessel at the at T cold and also provides shielding to try to keep the vessel with as low a neutron flux as possible. Say so the fuel height is five and a half meters. Uh, we've got both permanent and replaceable reflectors. Our power density is kind of intermediate uh, on there. It's, it's significantly higher than a gas reactor, but much lower than a, a traditional water reactor because we don't want to drive the things very hard. Things like flow accelerated vibration, those, some of these things are real pains. When we run the economic models, it says it comes out better than a, than a PWR. Of course it comes out better. We have a higher efficiency, uh, efficiency for operation because of the higher temperature, and we have shorter outages because we can move our fuel faster. The problem is that PWRs are real, and we're paper reactor as of yet. If we do things right, we will be better, so we have a good target to aim at, but it is not something we can claim right now because we are not there yet. We cannot build one of our reactors. It's just if you could could build one, it would do that. Neither do any of the other small modular reactors have that as their, you know, really. I mean, you're in a, we're in a world of transition, so you're up against other things that are also not real yet. There's an awful lot of promise to this reactor class, uh, even just as a uh, precursor if you want to go further on to a, onto a true molten salt reactor. However, there is an awful lot of technology and an awful lot of licensing and, and maturation that still needs to be done before you want to make this uh, these reality. I always end when, on this one on uh, Admiral Rickover's slide. I'm sure you've seen this uh, before, but if you don't understand the difference between a paper reactor and a real reactor, it is 
this is what we're trying to change and make us a real reactor. But right now we're a paper reactor. There's just that's that's what we are. That's where we are. How much do um, decision makers and policy makers within the DOE and, and and politicians get exposed to this kind of thinking? You know, if we can get congressmen to take an interest, it's, they're not going to make it happen, but they can at least ease the path. We do, in fact, spend a lot of time with our congressmen and our Senate. And Tom Mason will go and give briefings like this. I've given multiple briefings like this, mm. uh, and it's it's just politics, right? There's limited resources, right. and so but we were just saying, training. Training. We're just saying that I don't think uh, the technical, I don't think the challenges for nuclear are technical or engineering, even I, I, notwithstanding the fact that there's a lot of R and D to do, it's largely it's political. I agree. Yeah. It's a, it's, it is shifting people's thinking to think a little bit more long term than just short term and right now there's a lot of focus on uh, assuring the LWR industry uh, gets you know we, as we talk about the life extension moving to small modular reactors and, and uh, so trying to keep you so had a whole bunch of Democrats that said until you figure out fuel uh, spent fuel storage we're not going to give you money to go do uh, nuclear R&D right and so it's become a a, a point where they trade, right? Mm. We'll go ahead and, and support the SMR expenditure investment, um, but you guys need to put a consolidation site together for getting spent fuel uh, put in one location, and and so it, and, and that that moves slowly, right? Mm. Uh, too slowly, frankly. But We'll also point out that this fuel is not water soluble, which is kind of a neat little thing about if you want to store it for very long periods of time, this can be stored and have very much uh, much less uh, than the LWR uh, because uh, we don't have zirconium on the outside. We don't have oxide. This is not water soluble. It is a much more stable fuel form. Same reasons it's a stable fuel form in the liquid. A nice feature to have. And see, I think the UK, from what I know, they're in a bigger transition mode than we are. Oh, because yes. you're moving yeah. from the gas to, a, and you've got the one PWR you're you're going <laughs> forward with, and so there's still that sort of there's not that commitment to industry, and obviously your industry is still very much in a flux. Yeah. But you also have the you correct me if I'm wrong, but you also have a very much to the infrastructure there, so you haven't lost that yet. No. We've got there are a few extra drivers that we have. One is that, uh, as you say, you know we don't have that many PWRs. The life extensions we can grant, you know, that are, are being done, but they can't be going on indefinitely. Um, but also we have a carbon price. I was out in Beijing and I met with the environment minister, but I haven't spoken to the sort of cast people. I really want to. Right. So they they came to see us a couple of times. We got a memorandum of agreement between DOE and CAS. But one of the things they're doing, they're doing the thorium. Uh, MSR, mm. but they're, they've shifted and decided to go with the pebble bed first, as David said a couple of times. And the reason is because uh, it does remove, take them one step removed from a, some of the issues with fueled salts, but it allows them also to use thorium in those pebbles. So they're going to do a, a moving core, which is going to be the pebble beds. Those, um, those pebbles will move through the oh, core. Oh, they'll move, I see. Yeah, 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 we didn't show you that. They sort of they sort of shuffle through the core, and you pull them out, and if they're if they're burned to their lifetime, you take them out. If you've not, you put them right back in. It's a moving core, much like the, uh, the, the MSR. Yeah. yeah. This was largely research. Yeah, so they used it to, as a prototype for the Hanford reactors uh, to produce gram companies and materials during the war. And then after the war, it was a researcher who radiated stuff, mm -hmm. produced isotopes, did all sorts of things. And of course, we're so used to sitting in front of a computer screen, but obviously none of that. It was just... Of course, no, this was here in the 40s. This was all, I think this was all built after. I don't think yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these recorders, you know, the air would go out the stack, so they'd monitor the no radioactivity, and they could shut down if there's a problem. This is the original log, log book, so it went critical. You can see right here, criticality achieved is at 5 a.m. Oh, wow. on uh, November 4th, 1943. Yep. How did they detect that it went critical? They measured the power. The power is increasing, uh -huh. and it's critical. Yeah. They had a one-minute period. Need the power double every one minute. Fourteen slugs removed from bucket in back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> amazing. Not the bucket on the side. Uh, they had a what we call a rabbit. They could run things into the reactor and out into a laboratory pneumatically. And they, you can see they had a lot of lead shielding and stuff. So if things come out of the reactor, they could shield it. That went to a, a bar that that would scram the reactor. 
Mm -hmm. it looks sort, sort of like nothing. But yeah, a little so innocuous. So there was a handle on that, and you'd yank it, and you could scram the reactor. That was a and they never actually had to run that, uh, to use that, that, that one until the end, and that was when we found out a lot more about self-welding, because the balls that, which were uh, intended to run in there had stuck together. <laughs> oh. oh. Are, are they referring to that little piece that of cable? That little cable was a scram for this graphite <laughs> pile that they never used. Cable. This reactor started in, in November 1943 and operated for exactly 20 years. So what happens is those slugs fall out of the back end of the graphite yeah. there, and they fall down in this canal. <laughs> really? And then they, they take them over to the next building, which is the, the processing facility. Yeah, so that's yeah. how they get them there. They just, so you push a slug through, a slug falls out down into there, into water yeah. canal. And you'll notice this is at the top of the hill, because a series of processes, everything was done gravity-fed. And so the tank farm, which is the eventual waste, and the ponds are at the bottom of the hill. And this whole, everything was just started as a gravity-fed system. Amazing. Very now, the other, full side. The other thing to note here is these two devices here don't look special, but they're actually filled with sand. And if there's an issue with loss of power and they need to put the control rod drives in, which are right right here on that side of the reactor, mm -hmm. they don't need electrical power. So, so this was designed from the beginning to function in a loss of power situation, be able to put the control rods in. So it had a lot of mm. lot of you know design features in it that, that uh, you might not expect in the first reactor. So this is pretty much a solid block of concrete with the pile in the in the middle. So in the center, there's a 24 foot by 24 foot by 24 foot cube of graphite with holes in it. Basically, this was the first reactor to generate electricity. They put a, a copper tube in the reactor, boiled water, and lit a light bulb. That was a high school science kit. Yeah. This happened in 1948. So EBR2 generated electricity. In 1951. Uh, this was three years earlier. Well, it's funny, you know, I know you're a real materials guy. Um, you know, we're doing design work and so forth, but most of what we're doing has to do with materials and supply chain. I mean, that is, that's 70% like of what we work on. Oh, materials is, I mean, what is uh, it, the, the saying is that he who controls materials controls the world uh, on, the, on there. Is I can believe that. But also, you know, we're working a lot talking to people about the supply chain, and I think that's another place. If you don't have the supply chain, like you said, you can't build the machines. When you were saying you talk, we can't build it right now, I'm going, he's absolutely right. And I, I'm not, and I can list at least five reasons why we can't, you know. But we can change that with a few years of very concerted effort and good funding, you know. Are you on a committee within stuff, the... So. Okay, I'm on the opposition front bench, so... I am a shadow, so I have responsibility for energy and climate change issues as a whip. So I don't know if that means anything to you, but it just means that I, I'm often the spokesperson who stands up for the opposition parties on, in, on energy issues. And, I, and I've established a, a sort of caucus, a, an, an interest group in uh, looking at thorium energy, but we use thorium as a shorthand for thorium molten salts, really. And that's, that's attracted some 20 plus parliamentarians and, and my part of my trip here is to report back to them so they all know what's going on is how do you do the braise of the metal to the ceramic and how you do the joint between that metal and the ceramic because you've got the pipe you've got piping at some point and metal that joint huge, and that connection I know question. good and well where how the ORNL was planning on doing it and I I see what they said they were going to do, and I've seen some. We're not going to do that. I don't like. Uh, I, I, that, that joint. I don't, I don't is really want to say. I don't know exactly what we're going to do. I have some ideas. I'll share them with you. But I know we're not going to do that. The homogeneous reactor experiment was in this building. Everybody. So the homogeneous reactor experiment reactor test was in this building right here. Uh, you see, it looks pretty old. They built the HRE in here, and then they, after they operated that, they they had to bit, dig a big hole in this building, and then they built the HRT. And that reactor was an aqueous solution of uranium nitrate. Okay, Gordon, there you go, nail it. There it is, this is the place. You are going to be escorted into the hot body. You will not have unescorted access anywhere out there. You're only entering the radiological buffer area. Um, you do have to wear your POD between the neck and waist. So that's one of your responsibilities. Now, as we point out, we still have a few folks who are even operators here who are around. Sid Ball's office is just literally three over from me, and Sid was, you know, was was one of the operators at MSRE here. And uh, uh, yep, he actually had operated the, uh, uh, this. He was at the controls when it reached its highest power uh, uh, there.
the first building you see is the office building we're sitting in right now. And then it attaches through a breezeway to 7503, which is the reactor, the office building, the one, the one story building. The high bay area is the reactor bay area itself. And then those other auxiliary buildings, the, the, lar the stack, the 100 foot stack on the left is the stack that we currently use now to vent the uh, gases from the enclosures. Uh, the initial fuel loading in the reactor was U-235 and U-238, 227,000 grams. In 1968, they changed that fuel charge. They took out the U-235 and added uh, U-233. They thought the U-233 was the utopia of uranium fuel because it had the high energy thorium that uh, was a very high gamma and so nobody would want to steal it or had the capability of stealing. So anyway, U-233 was tested here and there was a little bit of U-235 in it and they added some plutonium-239 in that fuel mix. Question, uh, how much, do you know how much plutonium was added? Oh, about six, seven hundred grams. And uh, this fuel was mixed with metal salts, the fluoride uh, salts of lithium, beryllium, and zirconium. <laughs> And that salt remains in three tanks, basically, and those tanks have got about 6,000 pounds of salt in each tank. The next uh, picture you see is a reactor cell. When they were building the reactor, uh, you see a man standing down on the vessel uh, doing something. If you notice on the very top, there's an RGRS. The RGRS is Reactive Gas Removal System. And that's the system that we currently use when we vent the three drain tanks. And the drain tanks build up fluorine gas have to be removed periodically because of the pressure level. We keep the drain tanks at low atmospheric pressure. The, the fluorine builds up through a chemical reaction inside that metal saw by a radiological process. We vent the headspace from each of the three tanks on a regular basis. Since the reactor has been shut down for a long time, what is it that you are maintaining? Why do you need to maintain the pumps and the valves? And the salts are maintained in tanks that are isolated with uh, air-driven valves, mm -hmm. motorized valves. And we maintain a uh, Ingersoll ran air compressor system mm -hmm. that maintains the air to keep these valves closed or open, and there's dozens of valves involved in this arrangement. You shouldn't believe that since the reactor has been retired, it's continued to off-gas the fluorine since then. It's only been since 2008 that we regenerated the salts and then uh, okay. put in fluorine in order to <coughs> volatilize the uranium to get it to come off into the traps too. Is what talk about. So to remove the uranium-233, you didn't reheat the salts, you just... We, we did. You reheated them and then fluorinated them. Yes, we did. You gotta understand, those people are going into the high bay. This is an old facility. There's been a lot of work that's gone on in the past several years. Look down before you walk, okay? That's our biggest hazard here right now. Oh! Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've modeled this shape neutronically. Can I touch it? Well, sure. No, don't, don't touch Let's it. Your hands are going to look like this. Okay. I have a small child. So is this full size? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. It is oh. like a lead pencil, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Basically. Who, who manufactured it? Poco Graphite manufactured this. Having this stuff on my fingers is like the equivalent of being a teenage girl who just hugged her favorite boy band. This is actually where they heated oh. their tanks up. Yeah. That's a monitoring system that we have on the stack that's alpha, beta, gamma. Oh. This was all hard piped in, but yet the tanks were suspended. Huh. So that, that just kind of blew me away when I learned about this. Well, I studied the instrumentation, and it was actually a non-trivial problem to figure out how full the tank was, so they weighed it. They weighed it. That's how they did it. Weighted. We weighed the traps here. We, we mounted a strain gauge, which is still here, on this, on this uh, beam. And the trap was brought over here with a, uh, with a low boy or a little gadget that we pull. The carrier, there's two of them sitting right there. They weigh about 600 pounds a piece. And so we'd bring the carrier over, line it up with the scale, take the top off of it, and then reach down with a hand tool, pick the trap up and hook it on the strain gauge and weigh it. 
And we, we had to weigh it, you know, we're dealing with uranium in, in very precise uh, measurements. So, so what, how, um, how precise did you have to be? Oh, less than a half a gram. You should have seen on the blue part, but that's it. Okay. Don't touch anything. Don't touch Remind me, what was this used for? This is for the... To operate the RGRS, to operate the valves. Oh, to, this is to help with the venting of the gases. Right, the yeah. Gas. I'm not going to put my hands you in. Put your hands Don't put your hands in. No. <laughs> we'll have to cut them off. Oh, no, exactly. I'm going to put them straight back in my pockets. Don't put your hands in. <laughs> Thank you. There's a pair of blowers that would blow air through over a radiator that would cool the salt before it went back in the reactor. And they, they attach outside the building right here. And I think this is East Tennessee. If you dig more than 15 feet or so, we have water. You have water. Huh? So this tunnel shows how deep the connection is from the bottom of the reactor vessel over to the drain tanks. That's the sump area. These are the probes that we used. Uh, the box is the top part of the probe that we had the controls. We could tell exactly how far down the probe was moving and, and the weight of it and all this stuff. So the probe had five zone heaters on the end of it. The end zone heated and it would melt a pool in that salt and would sink down in it. So when it got in within a few inches, we would start sparging HF gas through this molten salt. Mm -hmm. And that HF would recondition the salt back to its original crystal. When we were going to move the salts out of the the tank in the storage position, we were going to pressurize the tanks moderately, you know, still keeping them below 50 psi, cause a siphon, which would cause the, the flowing salt to come over into these transportation caps. Oh, perfect! Now you can get it. Now you can get a video of it. Oven, oven cell. You can see the walls around it. All that the heat trace in order to bring the uh, salt out of the storage tanks into those transportation cabs that can slide over. So those are newer transportation cabs? Those were built for this project. Okay. We were going to take that salt while it was molten and flow it into these transportation cabs. When we removed uranium, we shipped it over to a storage facility, 3019, which is on site. And they have the world's collection of U-233. There's about a hundred different inventory items over okay. in 3019, uh -huh. and then and dozens of different forms, powders, plates, liquids, okay. salt, whatever. The salt portion of that inventory came from this reactor. The, the, the other direction, I'm not allowed to shoot in, it, but it looks pretty interesting. The amount of uranium in there dictates security levels that we put on the six. That, that dictates a lot of We're category two facility here, so basically everything that we photograph and do, they're going to want to see what we're giving them so they go, so we don't get off any of information. Yeah. I don't know what's secure, what they can and cannot see. There are people that are trained that can look at those photographs and say, no, we don't want this shape to go out. We don't want this. We don't want them to know that we were using this type of gas in here. It could be as simple as that. And they say, I wonder what they're using. Somebody may sit over, over and say, why do you got argon in the system for? And it may be the key to what they're looking for. Yeah. And we may have just given them that information by a simple photograph. When we talk about what we pull the headspace off the tanks and try to recover the uranium during the fuel salt removal process. Well, this is a room that controlled that uh, process to know whether we were extracting the gases off the headspace, whether we were sitting any kind of emissions up the stack and monitoring that. As it was going through the system, it would come up on our screens and it would tell us that we were putting certain contaminants out the stack, whether we were putting uranium and things of that nature. And basically we were putting any kind of uranium or things that would interest us, we would stop the process because that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be recovering this material. So if we weren't doing a good recovery, then this was our means of telling us that we were doing either a good process or a bad process. And you have six peak. So we saw that it came out to be 20... 2090, 1290, we needed, we were putting uranium at the stack and we needed to stop. Our process wouldn't be as efficient as we needed it to be. So if if you were interested in uh, researching MSR, is there any value in maintaining the site as is or is it the educational value provided pretty much exhausted and now it's just like you just as soon clean it up? Yeah. That's the point. I think so. I think it's a, it's a historical facility because of what was done here. But other than that, there's no, little, little bit limited value. And they are learning some things with all the data you're collecting. So if you ever have to decommission a molten salt reactor, there's a lot of data, right? We have lots of data for that, right. So, 
this was not designed as a power reactor and wasn't really designed so much when with decommissioning uh, in mind. As a matter of fact, all those long-handled tools they had for operations, those were it was almost heroic actions, you'd say, when they were trying to do things. I mean, you've got this lo length of distance, and we'd certainly try to design things today that you've got robots uh, to do with and design so that could be robotically handled for uh, when you're doing the decommissioning. It just would not be designed the same way as it was at that point. So this part of the building that you see is actually the 7503 portion with the high bay. This part of the 7509 was mainly just office areas. And they're just connected by a little breezeway. So when you say high bay, it's taller and we can put cranes in because we can lift things up. See that blue thing? What it's setting on? Those are shield blocks. So it's big white chunks of concrete. Now when they were running the actual reactor, those were in place. Then when they decided, okay, we got to defuel the stuff, they took them out and we moved them over here. So how radioactive are they? Yeah, they're not very, if they're sitting out in the open like that, not, not very is the answer. These things right over here are the spent probes that I was talking about. Those uh, right there? Yes. Those are the things we actually used and went down the tank, did the melting, did the gas additions, did this bubbling and stirring and everything. We have a couple of them in the high bay. I know you did probably get a chance to see it. That's why I brought you around here to see. Yeah. Those things would extend to like 60 foot in length. Because as you see, a lot of them, they started above the high bay. Like I said, you had to go down 20 feet. And you had to go down an additional 25 to get to the top of the tanks. Then it actually had to go inside the tanks. So those things would extend. So you got a pipe within a pipe. And those are a bit more radioactive because you can see they've got shielding on yeah. there and the caution sign says radiation area <laughs> inside there. Did you do a spectr uh, spectrum on those? We're trying to hold on to that because we're not sure from the scrapings whether we were actually seeing an indication of what the salt was, whether we're seeing what we scraped off, the actual, it was metal off the probe. Uh -huh. And we, didn't, we still don't understand about the homogeneous, whether it was homogeneous or not. So we don't really know whether we got a very good sample of this material or not. And people are kind of hesitant about telling people what that is until we find out. And I'm really hesitant about it because that's not my area, but because I, you know, analytical, you know, saying we don't know, you know, it could be this, could be this, could be the probe, it could be the saw. We don't know whether it's stratified, whether you got a good sample or not. I don't want to have something which just operates for nine days. We are trying to make a, a transition to a next generation of power that supplies a great deal of the world's energy for the next century. DOE is DOE directly is directly interacts with Congress. The national laboratories are not allowed to uh, petition Congress directly. I mean, we think our projects are important. We believe believe that there are is a great deal of value in fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactors. We think that passively safe reactors uh, that generate large quantities of power. Uh, power and with potential of being a low cost uh, or sh should be of a great deal of interest to the world. Uh, particularly think things like uh, being able to produce these with uh, domestically produced components as well as uh, being able to produce hydrocarbons uh, with a nuclear power and reduce our national dependence upon imported oil uh, are very important. Uh, and we're hoping that we can contribute to, uh, to solving some of the nation's energy uh, challenges. We get a limited amount of money through, through the Advanced Reactor Concepts Program. Uh, it's a s very small program, but we try to keep it alive, and we have a number of people who, I mean, Oak Ridge works as a team. We're a very team-oriented organization. That's why you're seeing all of the people, the lab director, the deputy lab directors, two of uh, them. We've got a number of people who work together, and we're all trying to encourage uh, DOE uh, that we believe that this is in the nation's best interest. Providing technical information to DOE is what we do. You can't lobby Congress. We only respond when, if Congress asks for our technical opinions, then we can provide the technical opinions. We, we are not paid by Congress to go lobby them, and, and all of our efforts uh, are things that are under the direction of Congress through the U.S. Department of Energy. That is only uh, the DOE's uh, responsibility to, uh, to go ahead and advise Congress. We are slowly making progress. We are always advocating we should go faster. I believe that the nation spends I would, I would think the nation should spend a considerable more amount of money on energy research, uh, research, and that this is a very desirable pro project to be spending uh, time, uh, spending money and time on. So, do you think you'll get to build one in your career? I hope so.
believe I was in seventh grade when I decided I wanted to uh, make my life towards advanced reactors. Really? And so I have been uh, pushing, uh, pursuing this for a great number of years. What did you see in the seventh grade that... Uh... I read an Isaac Asimov story about cold fusion on there and the, and the implications of what free energy would do. And I sort of knew I wanted something, I was going to be an engineer or scientist just from day one. And this sort of said, okay, what can you do to make a difference? And that was where I, I sort of said, well, advanced, advanced nuclear power was something that could make a difference. And that free energy or very much low cost clean energy could make a, a huge difference to society. If I'm going to have to get up every day for 50 or 60 years and working on something, well, it ought to be something I believe in. So I'm, I've worked on reactors my whole career here. So even one reactor is more that popular. Jess and I have similar amounts of experience here. And there's a big hole in the reactor experience. There's a lot of folks with very gray hair and a lot of re retirees. And there's a lot of some new young people. If you look at the the uh, you know the population curve, it's a double hump curve, and we're at the bottom of the bottom of the hump. Jess and I are some of the few that are in this age group. Said, you know, when we went into nuclear energy, they said, "What are you nuts?" Yeah, <laughs> there's no future in that. And it really didn't matter. We, we say it's the true believers who were who were left there. Kirk's got a new Facebook update page. I think it's got he and the uh, Baroness holding a graphite rod about the height of the two of them. <laughs> My name is Steve Burnett. I'm the Hyper plant manager. Uh, as, you, as you may have heard earlier, Hyper is not a new reactor by a long shot. It was designed in the late 50s and uh, built, started construction in 58 and went online in 1965. And the whole purpose of, of Hyper when it was built was to, as like its name implies, High Flux Isotope Reactor is to make isotopes, heavy isotopes, man-made isotopes that no one else can make. So the very first year that Hyper ran, it ran for 10 cycles, and after one year they were able to make one half of one gram of Californium-252. And what are some of the uses of Californium? Californium-252 is a neutron source. So every reactor, whether it's a research reactor or a commercial reactor or a reactor on a atomic submarine has to have a source of neutrons to start. So. Californium is that source. Now, in this country, every oil well drilled, they drill down so far, they drop a Californium source down there, do a geological mapping, look for certain pockets, and do directional drilling to the oil. Also, every coal mine, when they pull the coal up, they pull it out, run it by a Californium source, and it segregates the high sulfur and the low sulfur coal so we can get cleaner burning coal. Why is Californium particularly good for that? Because it's a spontaneous fissioner. It's one of the only things that will spontaneously fission. You don't have to put it in a reactor to make it fission. It'll just do it all by itself. So it makes a lot of neutrons. And then after 9-11, every airport in this country, when you put your luggage on the carousel and it goes away, it runs through an instrument that has a Californium source in it and it looks for drugs and explosives in your luggage. Or also when you go through, put stuff on the x-ray machine every now and then, they'll take away They'll see something, take away and take a little swipe and swipe it, put it in this machine with a Californium source that looks for the same thing. So, and Hyper uh, produces about 80 to 90 percent of the world's supply of Californium. Only, other one, other, only other, one other reactor in Russia can produce Californium. It takes a very high neutron flux. How much do you make each year? They do it in campaigns. It? It's not like a, it's not it hasn't been a steady state annual production. Mm. Hyper is a, a swimming pool type reactor, light water, moderated, and brilliant reflected. From the bridge to the right is the reactor pool, to the left of the bridge is the spent fuel pool. So the reactor is in the pressure vessel, about 8 feet in diameter, 17 feet tall, 20 feet underwater. So the top of the vessel is 20 feet underwater, and then from the top of the vessel down to the fuel is another 9 feet. This is the reactor control room. It's, it's genuinely live. It's genuinely time. live. Now the reactor's not running right now. When we're running, this is where the reactor operator sits. This is the board he's watching. The thing that makes Hyper unique is its fuel. And we have a sample of the fuel right over here. A full scale model of Hyper's fuel. So if you were a commercial power plant making fuel, your fuel would be 12 to 15 feet square, 12 feet deep, you know, metric tons of fuel. And you would use uranium that's enriched to 4%. Now if you take, the uranium we use in fuel just occurs 
less than 1% in nature, so they have to concentrate it to get it to use in fuel. And if you keep concentrating the fuel, the uranium you use in, in reactor fuel, to 98% you make bombs. 98% bombs, 4% commercial power fuel. High-first fuel is 93% enriched. So that's different. A commercial power plant, you load the fuel up, it runs for 18 months or longer, it runs out of fuel, and it's shut down and re refuel. At our fuel, we load it up, runs for 20, three, 24, 25 days, and we shut down. So if you essentially had this and immersed it in water, you'd have a hyphen, right? We have to have something to control it, something to reflect the neutrons. Oh, you need the, the reflector, neutrons. okay. Now this part in the middle where you see these things sticking up, that's what makes hyphen unique. This is our flux trap. That's where we put experiments. And so there's 31 different rods that go in there, and those 31 positions are the positions we use to make that half a gram of California P52 back in 1966. This reactor and the facilities here were all built for that hole. So Heifer's claim to fame is we have more neutrons in this area, in this flux trap, than any other reactor in the world. And everything we do is based on the fact that we have more neutrons here than anything else. Now, in this area we do materials damage studies on certain materials, and we make other isotopes. One of the isotope campaigns we're making right now is selenium-75. That's used as a gamma source to make for an X-ray source. Uh, just last summer, we irradiated what we call a rabbit, a little small capsule about that long, with lutetium in it. We sent it to the Netherlands, and 26 patients were treated for brain cancer with this one capsule. Now, important to me, 20 of the 26 were Americans. Mm. We couldn't get that therapy in this country because it wasn't FDA approved mm. yet. But lutetium, they use it for cancers that of the uh, hormone-producing glands, like the uh, thyroid gland, or pituitary gland, and so forth. When uh, the Canadian reactor shut down, they contacted us about making technetium because it was down for several years, and then other reactors in the world were down. We can make technetium, but the trouble is, it affects all of our other programs. To make technetium, we it only takes us about six days to irradiate it. So we would be running the reactor for six days, shutting down, have to pull all of it out, putting it back in, run six days, shut down, pull out. And that would affect our beam rooms. We're overbooked about four to one. The half-life of molybdenum makes it not really feasible to produce in this reactor. Our, our beam facilities are international user facilities. So if you want to use the beams here, we have a science committee outside of the laboratory, independent of the laboratory, reviews every experiment, looks for the most scientific relevant experiment. If, the, if, if you're willing to publish in open literature for everybody to see the results of your experiment, there's no radiation fee. Oh, okay. if, you're got, if you're a proprietary co company and want to do something and keep the data in the proprietary, then, then you're charged a fee for doing that. The same thing with using the in the vessel radiation facilities. If we're making isotopes for somebody, then there's a fee. Mm. If, if we're doing materials radiations and experiments that are people willing to share with everybody, then there's not a radiation thing. Okay. So, that sounds pretty awesome. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. It's true for all of our user facilities. It's true for SNS. It's true for our computer. Um, these are funded. The government funds it to get science out. As long as it's open and, and available to everybody, that's why we're here. So here's a source of neutrons. Here's our fuel. These control plates, a solid part of that plate, contains europium. Europium absorbs neutrons. This brilliant reflector reflects neutrons. We drive this inner cylinder down and add our four plates up till you get a little window right below that common area where there's no europium. So it makes a little slit, a little window. So now that neutron gets out, hits the brilliant reflector, reflects back in, hits the fuel. One makes two, geometric multiplication, and then we go critical. So if you do that and just lift that, so our fuel burns right in the center, center from the center out. So if you do that and then you don't change that gap. Pretty soon it'd be like you're driving down the road in your car and your car ran out of gas, you just sag out. So we measure that the heat, and as we start to get that, we open that window a little wider and burn some more fuel, open the window a little wider until 24 days later we've burnt the fuel. These are experiment holes in this beryllium, so I can put different experiments in here and do radiation studies. One of the things we're doing right now with one of these experiments is, you remember what happened in Fuk Fukushima? You know, tsunami wiped all their cooling out, everything started heating up. Now commercial reactor fuel has a zircaloy cladding around it that holds the fission gases. When that fuel got up to 1200 degrees C, that zircaloy gave off hydrogen and that's what blew the roofs off the place. Some of the material studies, silicon carbide coating, 
that wouldn't give off hydrogen at that temperature. In fact, we've got two Westinghouse fuel elements in here that we are radiating right now to prove out that concept. No hydrogen. No hydrogen. Now, the guys that built this weren't any dummies. As an afterthought, even though they were making isotopes, they decided to put four beam tubes in here. So they put four, put four tubes with just a, a stream of neutrons coming out. Three of those tubes we use for uh, neutron scattering, fast neutron scattering experiments. Now what you do with that is you look at metals, heavy metals, and as the neutrons hit it, it's almost like a scattergram. You measure the reflection off, and you can tell where the atoms are. And you can tell in a sample, atom by atom, what makes up your sample. You can tell if that atom's spinning or not. You can tell if it's polarized or not. So for solid matter, metals, we have the most intense neutron scattering instruments in the world to study that. They're not positive or negative, so you can't use magnets. No, so they just come through a tube, and through a concrete barrier, and just how many come out the end. So we lose some. Interesting. Okay, so you only keep those that are... That make it down the tube. Interesting. Okay. 2004, we took a tube that looked like this, and we crammed it up inside one of our beam tubes, and we circulated supercritical hydrogen in there at 18 degrees Kelvin. We looked at Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is similar to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Disease of the nervous system that affects the muscles. Huntington's is a, is a um, disease, hereditary disease that affects one in 10,000 people. And they actually isolated the Huntington protein. So we took this isolated Huntington protein, put it in our cold beam, and we looked at the, a neuron. I think we looked at the nucleus of a neuron. And in this nucleus, we saw these little fuzzy balls that weren't supposed to be there. And since this biological sample was alive, we watched it grow and watched those fuzzy balls turn into long stringers. That's the first time we'd seen the mechanism for what causes Huntington's disease. So now we're working with the medical community and the people that are working on treatments or, or ways to treat that, and we have follow-up experiments lined up that says, okay, let's apply this treatment and see. We can see if it's effective or not. That's pretty exciting. So for your short-lived radioisotopes, that's the size of the capsule. That's, that's a cylinder cut in half. That's the size of the rabbit that goes down <laughs> in and back out. So you're talking very small, that, now granted, very small amounts can mm. do phenomenal amounts. Yeah. This is a remarkable facility. This is, this is, this has done a lot of good for the United States, for the world, for humanity. I mean, it, to have a, a very intense source of neutrons, and it's another example of when people have talked about how terrible highly enriched uranium is. I mean, here's highly enriched uranium being put to very productive uses. Of, I mean, I just make a point. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it, you know. Jess, this has been incredible. I mean, this is like every tour I've had multiplied together times four, you know. I'm telling you, this is... And it's not lost at all. Not, the MSRE is unique. Turns out it was actually good for me because they're actually very excited to have people come see it. I asked them who else had been in, and they said we had a Japanese delegation. Something's changed because until before we could never get we did what? We could never get anybody in there. We didn't hear when we first walked in. They were reluctant to go on the highway. Like, well, why did we even come here if we can't go in there? You know? So by the time we left, well, they were showing us everything. Yeah, yeah. So they want. So this is precedent, and we're establishing over the precedent. The UK has a very different approach to licensing. You have an analytic approach, which actually is very interesting. Some of your Bev Littlewood and some of the people who do a very mathematical and formal approach, it is a different structure uh, because each nation, that's why there isn't a common uh, regulatory structure because each nation, it sort of reflects the history and the culture of how the, I mean, the U.S. is a very confrontational, litigious uh, way of doing things. Uh, the British is very uh, sort of analytic and formal method it's uh, very, and the French are a very command structure that this is acceptable because we said it was, uh, was, was in, but and that's why we haven't gotten a unified structure. Is, is you almost see the culture of the nations embedded in their in their licensing. But it, but the, none, none of them are quick. Oh no, uh, and yeah, to, to some amount, you have to say. 
they shouldn't be really quick and easy on there. There was there's just there's just some significant serious uh, you know consideration that needs to be put into this. In your presentation, you hinted at the fact that because of the apparent passive safety features, you're going to have a little bit of an easier task. And indeed, and the NRC is not this dragon that you have to worry. I mean, you do go ahead and you say this is the way we do things, and how do we phrase what we have to do so it fits within their language and so that they are can be more familiar. It's going to take us a while. There's no question that this is a, a major effort, but we have to understand what demonstrations will be necessary. How do we get so that we can support their licensing mechanism? I am not trying to tell the NRC how to license a reactor because, you know, say, they have many years of experience on doing that, and trying to do a revolutionary new approach to licensing is not going to be within my budget. <laughs> but, it, but it, yeah, but have you had much engagement with? Them? We have had, with the uh, the people who are in charge of the research and the exploratory, had fairly positive reactions with, with their, but there's no formal because the NRC is a regulatory agency and we're not ready to be regulated yet. We hope to be able to get to a test reactor at some point, and, uh, but we are going to have our first design safety standard meeting coming up at the ANS summer meeting in uh, uh, June 24th even, and we'll have two members of the NRC who've committed that they're going to be part of us helping to create the de design safety standard Great. so that yeah. they'll be aware of what we're doing as we're doing it so that when we do we are ready to come to them it's not a well a prize and if we could in get the UK re-engaged in sufficient research there's no point in us competing I mean a test reactor here would be a good thing to collaborate on wouldn't it Oh, very much so. Yeah. Uh, well, because remember, we're so far from commercial. This is almost all open on here. We're working with the Chinese. We're trying to get a, a negotiations to work with the uh, the Indians on uh, here. There's very, I mean, this is, and there's no way we'd be doing this if this were very near to commercial, where it'd be an export control issue in addition. Uh, but because it's a long way, this is still science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, I hope to get to the point where we do have export control issues and we got companies with proprietary interests, but we're not there yet. See, now I asked these guys, I said, have you had other delegations come through? And they go, why would anyone be interested? And I said, well... Chi did the Chinese go there? Well, that's what I asked them. I said, well, India has a thorium research project. China does, Russia does. I go, any of them come through? He goes, the last delegation to come through here was Japan decades ago. Have you been to other national labs? Are they all as modern, Euro? No, no, this one is this much is more modern than a lot of the other ones I've seen, yeah. actually. So I'm, I'm really surprised, actually, because usually they're a mix. This is the closest thing you'll find in real life to an accelerator-driven reactor. It's not an accelerator-driven reactor, but it does have an accelerator, a very large accelerator, as you can see. A lot of people talk about accelerator-driven uh, reactors. Uh, to work, they would need a linear accelerator hitting a spallation target. Uh, this is uh, using protons to actually produce neutrons. Instead of fission, uh, we, ins we inject uh, protons up here, we ionize them, uh, we accelerate them through this uh, linear accelerator. And what propels it? Uh, RF frequency. These are charged charged particles, so you can accelerate charged particles with an electric, electric field. You can't accelerate neutrons. Or else. Yeah, and radio frequencies tied to it. You know, you, you get these waves that are actually, the, you know, every time they hit a magnet, they're growing, and that particle... Any voltage, any voltage difference, you can accelerate a charged particle. Right. That's how these units have... Yeah. Accelerating charged particles. It's like you surf the waves. That's what all this is about. All this is about generating the electric fields that you know from basically almost zero energy. Particles are flying yeah, there, flying and that's... There. And these straight. Are, these are you putting electric field gradient, accelerating it. Uh, these things literally are surfing along along the uh, the high frequencies because you're getting very near the speed of light. About 92 uh, percent the speed of light uh, by the time we uh, fling the protons into this accumulator ring. Okay, and so they spin around, and as they pulse. Uh, it picks up additional protons every time it swings around. So you get this proton cloud uh, swinging around the accumulator ring. And then we kick that out when we kind of reach a density of protons. And we uh, shoot them down to a liquid mercury target system that's about the size of a Volkswagen. 
and uh, that proton energy striking that liquid mercury target uh, is equivalent to about eight sticks of dynamite and it spalls off neutrons from those big big uh, nuclei of, of mercury and so uh, just like at HIFER for the neutron scattering mission uh, we use those uh, neutrons then to probe materials and uh, we do it off these beam lines. What does mercury turn into after spallation? I mean, is it like fission product distribution? It's a dog's breakfast. Yeah, yeah. it goes into all kinds yeah, of I don't things. Know if it's, really, it, it's, it's got a distribution to it like fission product. Okay. Yeah. Probably not double humped like fission, right? Because there's not two pieces. No, It'd be more like a. I don't recall off the top of my head. But Remember, you get 27 neutrons or something. I mean, it's, it's shredded. Yeah. You, you get it. So it drops from being mercury to, I don't know, something 27 atomic like mass units. Small. <laughs> Not quite that small. You get a whole distribution. And we have, in fact, talked about you know what would you know what would be the isotopic research that could go out of uh, actually looking at what the fission products are in the mercury. You know, there's spallation people that said spall spallation products are yeah. yeah. But we've just not done anything with it. Remember, we uh, started seeing beam on target in 2006, and our primary mission is materials. And so it's all about, at this point, standing up a very young organization and facility to have impactful science. Uh, there are collateral uh, benefits that we are exploring. For example, fission produces a hard neutron flux of about 1 MeV. Uh, tops, wouldn't you guess? And oh, that 10 to the 13, okay. yeah. A few MeV tops. Yeah, and uh, if you want to get into the fusion space, you want super high energy or hard neutrons at 14 MeV uh, is kind of the standard. And so what we've done is we've uh, been exploring with the fusion materials uh, folks, uh, actually installing, we get a lot of hard neutrons here, right? Uh, installing a little rabbit system like at HIFER where we can actually put materials next to that liquid mercury target and uh, look at the damage effects from those high energy neutrons coming off the spallation source. Uh, Europe's in the process, of course, of building the uh, European spallation source, and many of our scientists are on duty there, helping them design targets and accelerator systems. Uh, ISIS, your accelerator at Oxford, is the only thing close to this. So is this the only way to get those high-energy neutrons in a sufficient flux to do materials examination? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yeah, you could build a fast reactor, a high temperature fast reactor, which would give you some higher energy neutrons, but it's... Fission just can't produce... That is actually from the fusion. Yeah, so fission... So fission just can't put, produce neutrons of high enough energy to simulate fusion neutrons, but, but this can. This does. Okay. This does. So is this an important part of the, of the U.S.'s contribution to the ITER effort? Uh, right now, there is no no other source to do that material irradiation uh, currently planned in the in the world except for ITER. China's building a, sp a spallation source and uh, they will have limited opportunity there but right now this is the biggest thing on the planet. Does the LINAC run pretty semi-continuously to, to always be filling the accumulator ring and then you just let the pulses through as you want them? Yeah of course it does pulse you know the it, itself right so it's, it's all time. The ion source has got a steady bleed, but you know, when the RF frequency is flying down through there and it's time to uh, uh, correspond with the accumulator ring, which is time to correspond with the ejection. This is actually an ejection dump uh, where we just waste protons currently. And there's been a lot of folks that have wanted to set that up as an end station for material sciences. Uh, or even uh, looking at uh, neutrinos. A lot of people want to try to place us in the realm of high energy physics, but we're really not. We really are a materials facility. Uh, if you think about uh, CERN, you know, you're actually breaking apart subatomic particles, muons, gluons, you know, things very, very small that where you can't tell the difference between matter and energy almost, right? Then you get to nuclear physics and you see a lot of that at some of the, you know, stacking uh, neutrons and protons and understanding how you can d get neutron captures and, and decays and, you know, transmutation of elements. And uh, then you get into the nano scale, where actually you're putting, you know, stacks of molecules together and trying to understand uh, at what point do you get stacks big enough to define the function of the material, whether it's structural, whether it's electromagnetic, uh, or whether it's uh, thermal properties of the material. And so we kind of operate in that scale from nano to actual functionality of the material. And uh, uh, so that's, that's where the light sources and neutron sources play, as opposed to high energy physics, nuclear physics, and other, you know, the, that meso region, right? What do you use for your proton source? 
uh, it's, it's a hydrogen leak, if that's what you're referring to, or we uh, ionize uh, hydrogen. Oh, you just ionize hydrogen? Mm -hmm. Just ionize it. So what happens with Proton. all the extra electrons? You make electricity actually, with it or something? It goes to ground. <laughs> oh, it all goes to ground. What a shame. You could yeah. use them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's really quite impressive when we lose our ion source, you know. It sends out little lightning bolts and stuff. There's a lot of electricity involved there. That, you know, you, at HIFER, you get lots of pixels of data. Your detectors, uh, the largest we have is about, a, is about a meter square with a five millimeter grid. And so you can kind of see the neutrons in that, that number of pixels. Uh, and you generally have a monochromatic beam coming off the reactor. Here we actually get all wavelengths with every pulse. And so not only do you have uh, 40 meter square detectors instead of one meter, but you also get every wavelength and it comes in at 60 times a second. And so the data rates here, you know, approach teraflop. No other facility in the world has seen those data rates, user facility, except for the scientific computing guys that have now built these massively parallel computers. And we're now taking their technology and le learning to use the data. This is actually some microscopy of Huntington's disease. And so we take the data, which show up as pixels, and then we run it through models, and it gives us these images that help you understand what's going on, right? I've been here probably half a dozen times, and I mean, this one, this tour blows all the rest out of the water. Tons of stuff you're doing with FHR is in common with what we're doing with Lifter. Oh yeah, what well, say? Uh, I I can certainly see that you know, there are reasons for looking at thorium reactors as a follow-on and you know, the true molten salt reactor. I mean, there are some advantages with fast spectrum molten salt reactors too. I've studied your paper on that a ton because I've found every single paper on that subject and I archived them on my site. That was the first new work that had been done on this in 30 years. People like the Baroness are attracted to this because it is a long-term solution. But when we get there, we will have solved the energy problem forever. Well, that's why the material science bit of it is, is so important because it's applicable to so many different technologies. It is. Not just the... Soft matter, hard matter, it, it's all there. You know, if you think of what happened in the 30s and 40s and 50s at Bell Labs, you know, it just introduced a new way of of everything. I mean, these would not have been possible if we hadn't have had the Shockley breakthroughs and the, you know, the... And so, you know, we've got to create that environment. What we try to tell our young staff is that every experiment's worth about $500,000. Don't waste a single neutron. You know, make it count, right? And with any luck, because uh, there is some luck involved, we will have some additional major breakthroughs. Yeah. It'll change the human condition in some favorable way. This is PALGEN. They're looking at magnetic properties of materials. We would like a battery that acted more like a capacitor. You could fill up your electric vehicle at the service station if you could wait there for four minutes, right? Yeah. And is that possible? I mean, in theory? They're uh, currently competing a battery hub, and it's funded at $25 million a year uh, by the government. And there are several teams that have come together to try to uh, win this, and we are one of the, the teams. But regardless of whether Oak Ridge wins it or not, we'll be supplying our capability to whomever uh, decides to do it. You can see it now, right? This is our this is our one really uh, fundamental science beamline. You know, we know neutrons; they've got mass, so they've got to have a dipole moment and things of that yeah, nature. Yeah, you right. know, so. Theoretically, you need it for it to behave the way it does. Nobel Prize, but we, okay. we will uh, use neutrons in this fashion too. <laughs> High spec is for inelastic neutron scattering. With a single crystal, you can get, have the, sort of all the atomic directions lined up. You can actually tell what the atoms are doing at the fundamental sort of level. Yeah. So we do the lattice vibrations, magnetic excitations. And so we're really interested in materials that can be used as thermoelectrics, heat harvesting, uh, superconductors, magnetic materials, mm -hmm. ferroelectric materials. So neutrons are produced in a pulse at the target, yeah. Yeah. they're cooled by the moderator, yeah. but they still emerge effectively as a pulse, they travel all the way down that guide. We have a series of what we call choppers that select different wavelengths or energies out of the neutron beam. Mm -hmm. They come on out, back in the shielding there, just past the Ferrari sticker, we have what we call a Fermi chopper that is like a sort of set of Venetian blinds spinning at about 240 hertz. So the blades sort of are open for 
very short period of time, 50 microseconds spinning closed, we time, we essentially phase the opening to select the particular velocity of neutrons we want. The beam is coming down, the crystals focus it, scatter it down onto the sample, means basically we have to pick everything up and move it around. So the detector vessel is on air pads, and this is essentially a set of metrological tables. So we pick it up on the air pads, move it around, it floats about 20 microns off the floor. <laughs> so when we change wavelength, the whole thing will move. This is actually an iridium uh, superconductor sample that's in there, it's switched off at the moment, because as I said, the beam's off, but we use this to cool it down to about 3K. The thing becomes, sort of has interesting properties around 12 Kelvin, something like that. Um, neutrons are scattered inelastically, come on out, we have an array of detector tubes at the back that are essentially, each tube is 1.2 meters long, it's pixelated so we can measure the position the neutron arrives and its time with respect to when the source fired. So we're essentially measuring the time of flight of the neutron from the source to the detector. Because that Fermi chopper and crystal selected one energy, we know the time it would take to get to the sample, we subtract that off. The time from the sample to the detectors tells us the velocity of the neutron after it's scattered from the sample. Mm -hmm. Velocity is energy, so we're measuring the energy difference between the energy we brought in and essentially the time spectrum is measuring a spectrum of energies out. So we're collecting that on 160 detector tubes for 128 pixels, essentially with a few microseconds resolution. What's your material of your detector tubes? Um, the tubes themselves are steel, but they have helium-3 in them. Oh, with a high, okay. high voltage okay. wire. Okay. We're Americans, you see. Uh, we have helium-3. Right, right, I know right. my colleagues at the European Spallation Source are working very hard on boron okay. um, you know, detectors at the okay. moment. But okay. yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's all right. Curious. That's so, okay. Um, that's and what's uh, the material of your Bragg rating? Oh, this, um, we have graphite in there. It's a bra graphite um, hi graphite. Highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. Okay. So you can actually, you know, essentially order graphite along the C-axis. Oh. Um, by a high sort of pressing it at high temperature under water and various things. Um, so we use that actually for unpolarized neutrons. We can also do experiments for neutron polarization. Apart from the energy and momentum when you scatter from the sample, you can also, the neutron has a magnetic moment. So if you polarize the neutron beam so that all the magnetic moments are the same, when you interact with the magnetic material and create the excitation, you change the magnetic moment and we can do that polarization analysis. So we have a second set of crystals in there that we can lift up. They're Heusler crystals that by sheer luck, the 111 reflection from Heusler, if you magnetize it, various things cancel and you'll polarize the beam. We then have magnets inside to carry the thing out here. And although we don't have it down here at the moment, we've taken it back. We have a set of coils, an analyzing filter that we can mount in front of the detector vessel for analyzing the outgoing polarization which again is polarized helium-3 gas. Nice. Mark's also uh, leading our effort to try to figure out how to deal with the big data and convert it into the images that, that you don't have to be a, a physicist to understand what you're looking at. And that's uh, one of our aspirations, to open up neutrons to a broader set of scientists. And it's a major effort that he's leading for us as well. A lot of helium-3 gas. Oh, really? Oh, that's very valuable right now. Yeah. Yeah, some of my old NASA buddies still think that's worth chasing on the moon. I said, dude, trust me, for as much as it costs to put things in space, we should just enrich lithium, throw it in a reactor, and make tritium, and wait for it to Just decay. cook it, right? Just, just cook, cook it. it. Right here is uh, the exact location, about 20 feet below us, of the proton beam. Right, it's okay. So it's entering the facility right here below us. Oh, wow. So is the target below us? Or no, no, target's over there. This is where the beam goes through. It's where all the spokes come together. You know, if you look at all the instruments, they're in a radial fashion. And, you know, think of those like spokes. The target's right in the center of that hub. So the fusion program really wasn't the main motivator to build SNS? No, no. It was pure material sciences. Okay. But does the fusion program still have, I mean, is it a fraction of the reason why they built SNS? Uh, no, okay. it really wasn't. You know, they, they built this for material sciences, and the whole idea was to actually, uh, uh, if you have a big proton accelerator and it's got extra capacity, 
infusions really needing something, they don't have to build it. So it's an in, you know it's an aftermarket interest, if you will. Okay. For example, Hyfer was built uh, to produce isotopes, but uh, uh, Alvin Weinberg demanded that we put in beam tubes. Yes, yes. Right? It's like a forerunner almost. Right, and uh, so it uh, today is funded for neutron scattering, although we still produce isotopes. A multi-mission for these investments is probably good. The difference between a spallation source and a reactor really is that you get time with this. And so you get all of the wavelengths in a non-chaotic manner. And in, 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 in a reactor, they're all generated at once, and so that you get them, but they're all chaos. And here I sort of treat it as sort of like frequency analysis on here. You're getting an FFT uh, with the neutrons, so the neutrons have more value because we know what the energy it was. You just get this huge bulk of neutrons. You get a hundred times more with the reactor, but they don't have a time code on them. You saw the big uh, SANS instruments, small angle neutron scattering instruments at Hyfer. This is a similar type technology. The big blue tank is the EQ SANS. And of course, that's letting us look at biological and you know polymer structures. But probably our most industrial-specific uh, instrument is actually in another building behind this wall. It's called Vulcan, and it allows us to evaluate the residual stress in materials. Uh, for example, if you think about the Eater project, you know they've got that central solenoid of superconducting materials, and they keep failing it. They, they it's not making specification. Uh, they actually took a section of that central solenoid and operated it at uh, temperature and they measured the residual stress uh, in the materials as they, you know, those p magnetic pulses deformed the material and ended up reducing the ability to stay superconducting after so many cycles of stress. Uh, so that right there could lead to a billion dollar decision on how to proceed with the, the EATER project itself based on that data. Okay. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work here with shape memory materials. Uh, General Electric and some of the NASA uh, Glenn folks are looking at uh, uh, shape memory uh, materials to actually uh, serve as actuators or uh, even on you know single crystal uh, aircraft turbines. Yeah, right. uh, you think about uh, if you could, you know, the twist, the angle on those turbines uh, affects the efficiency. And at ground level, you've got a certain temperature. Uh, you know, at 15,000 feet, that temperature range is different, okay. and then at 30,000 feet, it's it's different again. And they need to develop a single crystal material that has shape memory that actually morphs under these different thermal uh, properties, and then it proves efficiency of the the flight. What does it mean, memory? Like, th th will it adapt back when it? Yes. I think it's I think it's thermally. I think it really is based usually on temperature. Or current or pressure. Okay. Yeah, all of these things matter and different materials respond differently and the shape memory is, you know, it goes back and forth across those, those properties. No, I think it was time very well spent with her because she is in a position uh, okay. within her government to make things happen. And yeah, her, hopefully it helps her be better informed. Absolutely. I told her, I said, I want to turn you into the smartest person on this in the whole House of Lords. Yeah, good. She said, that won't take very long. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. They actually do have a lot of smart folks in the House of Lords. The Astronomer Royal, they have a lot of, uh -huh. they have a lot of doctors. They have a, they have a really wide diversity yeah. of, uh, of professions. But, you know, you know, none of them yeah, are nuclear often, engineers, you know. Miss, but you, it's hard to get sort of nuts and bolts, like physical scientists or engineers. Yeah. They don't really gravitate towards the political thing. I'm trying to find out what are the leading alternate designs that are out there that can help us get to a, you know, more sustainable, cheaper, more economic nuclear fission future. And I, I'm, you know, everything I've heard about the use of molten salts as the coolant and the, uh, perhaps the switching out into a thorium fuel cycle. Right? Very, very intriguing because it gives you these big scale benefits. It's not incrementalism, you know, it's a kind of step change. Disruptive sort of yeah. technology. But yeah, disruptive sounds negative, but I think it's more just, you know, a leap to a, another state which is, has got a lot of inherent benefits. <laughs> Well, the guys at MSRE were fussing at me because they didn't have a whole day themselves. Oh, really? That's what they said. They said, you, you try to cram an hour and a half, a full day into an hour and a half. Said, well, we can stay tomorrow and go to MSRE again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot to digest, and I've learned a huge amount. And I suppose the thing that I'm most encouraged by is that there does seem to be quite a considerable amount of, I mean, you've clearly got huge expertise in delivering large-scale projects, but in the nuclear fission side, there's a sort of, a niche of work there that I hadn't appreciated was happening and that that's 
kind of hopefully going to grow with time and that you're playing an important role in meeting DOE's needs but also maybe shaping DOE thinking. And you can talk about this. We have four nuclear divisions, so to speak, fusion, uh, energy, we have the global nuclear security, we have the fuel cycle isotope division, the reactor and nuclear systems division, which is diesel. So it's a large piece of the laboratory under the yeah. that's devoted to nuclear. And for the first time, this just happened two years ago, we have an associate lab director responsible, so reporting directly, directly to a lab director. So it's a huge piece of what we do now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this lab did not have, as Jess was saying, did not have a nuclear sort of directorate level you know, acknowledgement, I guess, or at least organizationally, I mean, we were always nuclear. We just didn't talk about it much, you know, so. And it, out from under the bushel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then when you consider the lab history, it's really quite amazing that we kind of were in that sort of, I guess, two decades at least. Really what happened was in the 70s when the, you know, Mason said this morning, you know, we start a lot of our things with uh, a non-nuclear energy startup in the 70s with, mm -hmm. uh, with the oil crisis. Mm -hmm. And so that's the same time that they sort of dis sort of let the nuclear migrate out to different divisions and sort of hold up in the different divisions. And so in about 2000, they brought a lot of it back together, but just in, like Jeff said, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we brought it up to the directorate level and sort of really began to make sure we coalesced all the nuclear together. Try to make input, you know, but it's been disappointing in my career that we've struggled with forming an energy policy. Though things have gotten quite a bit better in the last five or six, when you say, Jess, I mean, we're all sort of contemporaries and yeah, came, you know. Good because not only because of the climate issues, but also the price of oil. Mm -hmm. People are saying some, we've got along, we got along for a number of decades not doing anything about energy because it was cheap and nobody was that concerned about climate. And it all sort of came together in the mid part of the 2000s. So we got to do something about climate and then the oil prices took mm -hmm. off. And so it's, it's clear something has to be done. Mm -hmm. So now, now that's pretty well recognized and the question is what? Mm -hmm. And actually firming that up into a plan that's a long-term plan to actually do something. And if we want to stay in touch with sort of developments, particularly with your work, David, in terms of the molten salt cool reactors, I mean, if you've got sort of timelines and kind of um, milestones where you'll be able to put stuff in the public domain or? All of our reports at the moment are going to go in the public domain. Uh, certainly Kirk will stay up with them, I am confident. DOE has not made a commitment uh, that it's going to build a test reactor or at any particular time that it w a timeline for doing that on there and we and we don't get to suppose when DOE elects to, to, uh, to make that type of a commitment. Uh, what is the level of commitment do you think? Um, we've got similarities to other uh, to a number of things in the high temperature materials pro program, but we're still in, you know in the in the sub ten million dollar range. And what do you need it? Do you need it to go up by a factor of ten or more? It would be very nice to have a research program that would would be a focused one for us uh, us for a number of years in the ten million dollar range uh, on there for a while because we s there are a number of sort of technology hurdles that we have to overcome before we're ready to say. I want to build, uh, you know, make the next commitment because you don't want to waste the, gov the the public's money on there. But I, but uh, I want to have the materials that I've got a qualified reactor vessel. I've got a qualified structural elements. I know who I'm going to buy lithium from. Uh, from I've got I've got a, my, a lot of the supply chain people who are saying, well, I'd like to work on th this uh, this and this. There's a number of years that we need to be in that type of a level because I need to have someone who can work with the NRC as a full time. Well, this is part of the sa helping us develop our safety and licensing uh, practices. On this, we uh, have to get our uh, sa the the safety tools and modeling. But we're not, you know, we're not ready to be a hundred million dollar a year program, uh, program, and we won't be for a while. We will eventually need that level of commitment. If you're going to build a test reactor, this is not a small commitment, and hopefully, because we are intending to be a low cost energy provider, and to some extent, you have to say that the capitalist system has to recognize, okay, we've built a test reactor, we've shown safety, we've got the materials, we've got the supply chains worked out, and that we will need to transfer over to whether it be Exxon building the reactor or or GE or or BP or or who DuPont. yeah Dupont. Uh, but we will have to develop someone with some very deep pockets uh, pockets to transition to. We're actually debating internally within the in the nuclear lab system. But uh, you know, what if we were going to build something? What would we build? Would we build a, a research and test reactor, sort of a ATR hyper or something that had 
multi-program use and from a business case that probably you know makes more sense but do we want to actually build a, a, a prototype reactor that actually demonstrates some game-changing technology for nuclear you know and that's we know your viewpoint, and, but as somebody was pointing out, the, the one... Uh, yeah, I think it was you, David, the one experiment ran for nine days, and we, yep. you know, we did the experiment, right? And so, so you, you, as you can see, like a facility like this, you know, what motivates the investment of a billion and a half dollars to, uh, th you know, that shows pay payback to the to the taxpayer and those kinds of things. You, you want so something that's flexible, basically. So, so you, it drives you towards these kind of user facilities. Something that's used in, in, a, in a large way. That's, what you just into yeah. it. that's not to say that a high temperature research reactor and that high temperature reactors can't be a central part of a science focus, but it's probably not going to be a billion dollar facility uh, uh, here, but it might be a few hundred million just on a, a, a there, but it has, but it's going to be a major national commitment when you're talking those types of numbers. We'd be very interested in knowing how your interactions with the, the uh, Chinese go as, as, they, as they evolve, because they will... Yeah, the Chinese sort of, sort of seem to be ready to try one of everything at, this, yeah. at the moment, right? You know? you know? And throw a lot of money and resources at it right. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now we'll find out more in, in the autumn when we're out there again. And we'll actually be there the week before with with uh, Assistant Secretary of Energy as part of his technical support team. But the but that week uh, where the Thorium Conference is is the MIT is doing its test reactor design review for FHRs, and so I'm going to be there. I need to be there for that. Yeah. So I will be there, be at MIT that week for that. So on different two sides of the planet, there's lots going on <laughs> in that one week. We've got to run soon to uh, go see some of these old retirees for dinner. Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Good to meet you. No, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. So this is the TVA Bull Run coal-fired power plant. It's, it's what powers the majority of Oak Ridge National Labs, energy-intensive research they're doing. Yeah, I find it ironic that the birthplace of many of our country's nuclear technologies is still run on coal. Hopefully we can change that over the next 10 years. In fact, if we could convert Oak Ridge National Labs, Y-12, and this campus, this reservation, to nuclear power instead of coal, the entire Department of Energy would meet its 25% zero carbon power production by 2025 goal. And now we're headed to dinner with some of the original Molten Salt Reactor Experiment team. The Great Outdoors.